Though Elvis Presley was known to be devoted to those he loved, he also had a short temper and had little patience for those he didn't like. Here are some celebrities Elvis couldn't stand. The careers of Elvis Presley and John Lennon took similar trajectories in that both were two of among the very biggest names in music and in popular culture as a whole at roughly the same time. Further, both men were big while the Vietnam War was going on. To say that the war was divisive is an understatement. Attitudes about the war extended beyond the well-publicized public demonstrations and the entire genre of music that protested the war. Public figures were quick to line up on either side of the debate as well. Celebrities like Jane Fonda and Muhammad Ali publicly opposed the war, while others like John Wayne supported it. Lennon was steadfastly opposed to the war in Vietnam and made no secret about it. Presley, however, supported the war, according to The Express, and was a big fan of then-President Lyndon Johnson, whom Lennon hated for going all-in on the war. Honey, I just, I just wanted to keep my own personal views about that to myself. When the two men finally met in 1965, their conflicting attitudes about the Vietnam War quickly came to the surface. No sooner had the Beatles entered Elvis' home than the tension between the two became apparent, according to author Chris Hutchins. Hutchins arranged the meeting and later wrote about it in the book Elvis and Lennon, the untold story of their deadly feud. He told the Daily Mail, Elvis' dislike of the pacifist Beatle was born from the night I took the Fab Four to his house for the first and last meeting. Why? Well, according to the Beatles press officer Tony Barrow, things started off on the wrong foot. Barrow told The Guardian, John asked what had happened to the old rock and roll Elvis, who at that point was mainly singing the soundtracks to his films. He was half joking, but he meant it. The tension was eventually eased by an old-fashioned jam session, but the hard feelings apparently lingered. Barrow told The Guardian, John said it had been about as exciting as meeting Engelbert Humperdinck. As for the other Beatles, they weren't exactly blown away either. I don't remember. I spent most of the party trying to suss out from his gang if anybody had any reefer. Elvis wasn't prepared to just stew about John Lennon, the Beatles' anti-Vietnam War stance, and the personal slight Elvis had suffered in his own home. He wanted Lennon gone, as in out of the USA. What's more, he actually went to none other than the President of the United States to get action. That's because Presley wasn't the only person keen to have Lennon silenced. The US government wasn't exactly thrilled with Lennon's anti-war sentiments either. So when Elvis met with President Richard Nixon on December 21, 1970, he found a receptive audience when he tried to convince the POTUS to find a way to get rid of Lennon and the Beatles. According to the official White House meeting notes from the president's personal file, Presley indicated that the Beatles had been a real force for anti-American spirit. He said that the Beatles came to this country, made their money, and then returned to England where they promoted an anti-American theme. The president nodded in agreement. And Elvis wasn't done lobbying for Lennon's removal. In 1971, during a tour of the FBI offices, the King met with then-director J. Edgar Hoover. According to government records, he expressed, "...the opinion that the Beatles laid the groundwork for many of the problems we are having with young people by their filthy, unkempt appearances and suggestive music." Elvis got his wish, as the FBI did indeed go after Lennon, spending years attempting to get him deported in order to ensure he didn't damage right-wing political goals through his activism. On the surface, Elvis and crooner Robert Goulet couldn't have been more different. The former was a boundary-pushing, controversial rock and roll pioneer, the latter an inoffensive, ballad-singing performer whose presence wouldn't be unexpected on The Lawrence Welk Show. Legend has it that the short-tempered Elvis had little patience for seeing Goulet on TV, and once shot one of his television sets when he saw the crooner perform. But while it's apparently true that Elvis did shoot a TV while Goulet was performing, the rumors of a supposed beef between them may have been overblown. According to author Lisa Rogers, Goulet would later call Presley a, quote, personal friend. And as for shooting a TV whenever Goulet was on, Presley reportedly did that to scores of TVs, and it had less to do with Goulet himself and more to do with the King's short fuse and his jealousy of all other performers. He was also known to fire at the TV when other popular singers such as Mel Torme or Frank Sinatra appeared as well. In fact, according to the Vintage News, Elvis' handlers kept scores of spare TVs around in case their boss happened to shoot one. That's kinda screwy. By the middle 1950s, rock and roll was becoming a thing, with pioneers like Elvis, Bill Haley, and Chuck Berry bringing a new form of music to the masses and teenagers eating it up. This presented something of a problem for old guard musicians like Bing Crosby, Perry Como, and the like. Careers were threatened, and concerns were raised about what effect the new form of music was having on the morality of America's youth. And Frank Sinatra, for his part, basically called rock and roll garbage. According to The Express, in 1957, he said of rock and roll, it fosters almost totally negative and destructive reactions in young people. It smells phony and false. It is sung, played, and written for the most part by cretinous goons. Elvis wasn't about to brook being called a cretinous goon by old blue eyes. In a press conference, Elvis responded by saying, He has a right to his opinion, but I can't see him knocking it for no good reason. 
I admire him as a performer and an actor, but I think he's badly mistaken about this. If I remember correctly, he was also part of a trend. I don't see how he can call the youth of today immoral and delinquent. The two seem to have buried the hatchet eventually, at least professionally. In 1960, after Elvis completed his time in the U.S. Army, Sinatra hosted a TV special called Welcome Home Elvis. No word whether anyone shot the TV. Few if any figures in rock and roll history are as timeless or controversial as Elvis Presley. Both a rebel and a heartthrob, Elvis changed the way the world thought about music, pop culture, and celebrity. Here's what the last 12 months of Elvis's life were like. As a young man embracing both the punishing work schedule and the stresses of newfound celebrity, Elvis was under a tremendous amount of pressure. Young Elvis became dependent on several different types of prescription drugs, specifically amphetamines to keep him awake and barbiturates to help him sleep or relax. Early on, these were heavily pushed by his manager, the infamous Colonel Tom Parker, who many believe swindled the naive young Elvis while running him ragged. By 1976, Elvis wasn't just getting his uppers and downers from his manager. He had a private doctor who would prescribe him any pill he asked for, according to a People magazine story published shortly after his death. Dr. George Nicopolis, aka Dr. Nick, traveled with Elvis and carried three suitcases of pills to make sure he could fulfill any of Elvis's needs. It was reported that over the last 20 months of Elvis's life, Dr. Nick prescribed him over 12,000 pills. The doctor claimed that they were for Presley's entourage as well. His excuse for throwing all these high-octane drugs around? If he didn't prescribe the pills to Elvis, someone else would, and at least this way he wouldn't get them off the street. The toxicology report from Elvis's death said he had the opiates Dilaudid, Demerol, and Percodin in his blood, not to mention quaaludes and codeine. However, though Dr. Nick was charged with 11 felony counts of overprescribing drugs, he was acquitted. The medical examiner claimed that Elvis had died of heart disease, adding, Had these drugs not been there, he still would have died. By 1976, Elvis had become disenfranchised and unhinged, his drug use, unhealthy lifestyle, and financial excess chipping away at his composure. He spent most of his time holed up in the elaborate den of his Memphis home, Graceland's Jungle Room, nicknamed for its exotic decor. Most worrisome to his record label, RCA, was that the king had become entirely uninterested in going into the studio and recording. That was when producer Felton Jarvis had a game-changing idea. If Elvis wouldn't go to the studio, they'd bring the studio to Elvis. Presley had recorded tracks at his home in Palm Springs in 1973 to great success, and said that he enjoyed being in a room with his fellow musicians to feed off their emotions. So why not set up a mobile studio in Graceland? Elvis approved the idea, and the label sent a studio truck to his home. In many ways, the jungle room was perfect for the task. It was huge, and its shag carpeting naturally absorbed ambient sound, although the fake waterfall did have to be turned off. It was there in October 1976 that Elvis recorded his final studio sessions, resulting in some of his most memorable and emotionally crushing material to date. In November 1976, Elvis split with his girlfriend of four years, Linda Thompson. Linda had been a stabilizing force in the singer's world, but she eventually left him because she wanted a more normal life. Replacing Linda was actress Ginger Alden, a woman 20 years Elvis's junior. In December 1976, after a brief courtship, the singer gave her a $70,000 engagement ring, an expenditure that many thought was more for show than actual sentiment. In turn, many in Elvis' entourage believed Ginger to be nothing more than a gold digger. Lamar Fike, a member of Elvis' Memphis Mafia entourage, famously said Ginger, quote, didn't give a rat's ass about him. In Ginger's mind, these opinions were unfair aspersions cast by her fiancé's cronies. She explained her side of the story in a 2019 interview with Elvis' Australian fan club while promoting her book Elvis and Ginger, Elvis Presley's fiancé and last love finally tells her story. Not getting to know them well, shortly after Elvis passed away, I was extremely disappointed to see the character of some that Elvis had around him. A few speculated and began telling untruths regarding Elvis and me, which were completely unwarranted, mean-spirited, and wrong. When critics and fans describe Elvis in his later years, it's not always done in the nicest of terms, but it's undeniable that Elvis' overeating and weight issues colored his last year on Earth. According to the New York Daily News, by the end of his life, Elvis was consuming enough calories to feed several people every day. Growing up in the South, Elvis took comfort in greasy, homestyle foods. As an adult, one of his favorite meals was a roll stuffed with bacon, peanut butter, and jelly, alongside midnight snacks like hamburgers and deep-fried bread. While he was also taking many dangerous pharmaceuticals throughout his life, it was the heart disease caused by his bad diet that may have been the greatest factor in his demise. The critics noted his weight gain when reviewing his public performances. In Reese Quinn's biography Elvis, writer Tony Sherman is quoted as saying that, by early 77, Presley had become a grotesque caricature of his sleek, energetic former self. Hugely overweight, his mind dulled by the pharmacopoeia he daily ingested, he was barely able to pull himself through his abbreviated concerts. 
Most challenging during Elvis' final years was the non-stop schedule of his live performances. During many shows, the audience wouldn't be able to understand what he was saying, and he would often leave the stage early, unable to continue. This manifested most notably in March 1977 during two stops in Louisiana. According to a 1977 review in Alexandria Town Talk, the first show in Alexandria lasted less than an hour before Elvis had to leave the stage. But according to the book, the mystery surrounding the death of Elvis Presley, even worse was in Baton Rouge where Elvis had to cancel the show because he couldn't make it out of his hotel bed in order to get to the venue. The rest of the tour was subsequently canceled, acting as a benchmark of just how far the king had fallen from the pedestal of his youth. I don't know all the chords, so if you hear me, you know, get my fingers caught and put in the keys back here, you know, you know what it is. By 1977, Elvis had lost all interest in recording new music. However, the home recording sessions of 1976 were fruitful and seemed to inspire a burst of creativity in the King. After the final recording session in October of 76, RCA set to work cobbling the tracks together in what would be Elvis's final records, a fact none of them knew but which the pained music seems to foreshadow in hindsight. Moody Blue, released in February 1977, was a mix of live recordings and new studio tracks, containing two of Presley's most widely regarded songs. The title track Moody Blue became Elvis' final number one single. The song is in keeping with the pop music of the time, but still showcases the warbly, lone figure that the singer had become. But it's She Thinks I Still Care that is regarded by many to be Elvis' finest latter-day moment. Elvis's passing is often used as the archetypal rock star death, a tragic accident caused by poor health and drug use. But was the king simply ignoring his well-being, or was he having suicidal thoughts? In the recent HBO documentary Elvis Presley The Searcher, the singer's longtime wife Priscilla revealed that she wasn't sure whether Elvis's death was really an accident. Priscilla pointed out that Elvis had written a note to a friend and Memphis Mafia member Joe Esposito which stated, I'm sick and tired of my life. Additionally, a report from the tabloid The Sun shows that Priscilla considered depictions of Elvis as a bystander in his own life to be inaccurate, saying that he was simply dismissive of attempts to help him get treatment. She said, He knew what he was doing, and people go, Why didn't anyone do anything? Well, that's not true. People there in the inner group did, but you did not tell Elvis what to do. You'd have been out of there faster than a scratched cat. They would try, and no way. Elvis' last gig was on June 26, 1977 at the Market Square Arena in Indianapolis to a crowd of 18,000 fans. The set list included many of his classic hits like Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel, and Jailhouse Rock, as well as newer numbers like Hurt and his cover of Bridge Over Troubled Water. As he had in recent gigs, Elvis appeared overweight and at times winded, but was reported to have given a solid performance overall. What confused some people, though, was that Elvis took a portion of the show to introduce everyone from his life and career from the stage. The moment came toward the end of the night, just before his closing performance of Can't Help Falling In Love With You. Many would later wonder if this was because Elvis knew somewhere deep down that he would never play again and wanted to shout out all of those who had made his career possible. Equally cryptic for some were the parting words the King said as he left the stage. To meet you again, may God bless you. Adios. Like many stars who became hugely famous before the concept of celebrity handlers had been formalized, Elvis was surrounded by yes-men and sycophants. This was especially true during the last year of his life, when he was deep in his chemical dependence and had left behind many of the loyal friends of his youth. The King's only true friend near the time of his death was arguably Letitia Henley, his live-in nurse. While the world at large saw Elvis as the man who had it all, Letitia, known to those around Elvis as Tish, had a private window into his personal struggles. Henley later wrote in her book, Taking Care of Elvis, Memories with Elvis as his private nurse and friend, He was not only my patient, but a good friend. He was miserable. He was depressed about aging and not having a woman he loved. He missed Priscilla. His friends kept pimping him with pretty 17 and 18-year-old girls, but he had nothing in common with them. Even Tish lives with pain surrounding Elvis' death, which she said came as a complete shock to her. When Elvis asked for sleeping pills during his final hours, it was she who told his private doctor where to find them, and she regrets not being there as he died. Given his pill dependency and excessive weight, some might assume that Elvis spent the day before his death lying in bed eating or doing drugs. But even more strange might be the sheer amount of activity undertaken by the King in the hours before he passed away. As detailed in the documentary Elvis Presley, The Last 24 Hours, Elvis's final day on Earth included a nighttime trip to the dentist in search of prescription drugs, a 4 a.m. game of racquetball with his cousin Billy Smith, and an impromptu piano performance of classics, including Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. The night ended around 6 the next morning, when he went into the bathroom to read. He was found there by Ginger Alden around 2 p.m. on August 17. Memphis Mafia foreman Joe Esposito said, The phone rings, intercom. One of the maids picks up the phone, and it's Ginger. 
She says, come upstairs, I need help. Elvis just fainted. I ran upstairs, I go into the bathroom, and Elvis had fell over and was lying on the floor. I turned him over, and I knew. I knew he was dead. Elvis Aaron Presley died August 16, 1977, at the age of 42. For fans of rock and roll everywhere, the King's death was a monumental blow. But with his life ended, those who loved him could now remember the man he had once been, revolutionizing rock music with his energy, charisma, and raw talent. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Elvis Presley is quite possibly the most influential musician of his generation. Sure, his career had a few low points, such as his utterly forgettable film work, and his final years were marked by drug addiction and poor health. The so-called king of rock and roll's music, however, speaks for itself and largely stands the test of time. Presley was far from perfect, and his character flaws are as much a part of the man's narrative as his music. He had a famously short temper and once went to the White House to volunteer to help President Richard Nixon with the nascent war on drugs in some unspecified way, despite being a user himself, claiming in a bizarre letter to Nixon that he had undertaken a, quote, in-depth study of drug abuse and communist brainwashing techniques. Fast forward to May 2021, when legendary musician and producer Quincy Jones accused the king of another character flaw, and a familiar one, racism. Specifically, Jones claimed that he and another musician refused to work with Elvis because of that racism. When The Hollywood Reporter asked the 88-year-old Jones if he had ever worked with Elvis, Jones said, quote, No, I wouldn't work with him. When asked why, Jones explained, I was writing for Tommy Dorsey, oh God, back then in the 50s, and Elvis came in and Tommy said, I don't want to play with him. He was a racist mother. I'm going to shut up now. But every time I saw Elvis, he was being coached by Otis Blackwell telling him how to sing. So is there any truth to Jones' claim? That's impossible to answer as the alleged event happened 70 years ago, and two of the three people who were in the room that day have been gone for decades. As for Jones's claim about Otis Blackwell coaching Elvis, Blackwell, who wrote Presley's hit song Don't Be Cruel, told David Letterman during an interview in 1984 that he never even met Elvis, so Jones may be somewhat mistaken. Uh, now, did, uh, did you ever meet Elvis Presley? No, I never met Elvis. Blackwell did, however, confirm to Letterman that Elvis openly imitated his singing style on Don't Be Cruel, so Jones was right about that part. According to David Pilgrim, curator of Ferris University's Jim Crow Museum, there is just no hard evidence out there that Presley was a racist, despite persistent decades-long rumors to the contrary. Pilgrim notes that Presley donated money to black causes, attended predominantly black churches during his youth in Tupelo, Mississippi, and consistently treated the black people he encountered with respect. On the other hand, Quincy Jones is far from the first person to accuse Elvis Presley of racism. Rap legend's public enemy called Presley straight-up racist in their 1989 song Fight the Power. In 2002, Mary J. Blige performed Presley's Blue Suede Shoes on VH1's Divas Live Special. Some criticized her for singing an Elvis song during her set, and she told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I prayed about it because I know Elvis was a racist, but that was just the song VH1 asked me to sing. It meant nothing to me. I didn't wear an Elvis flag. I didn't represent Elvis that day. While Elvis is no longer around to face these accusations, we can turn to sources that date back to his era. For example, a reporter questioned Presley in 1957 about whether or not he'd said a particular racist slur and he denied it, telling a reporter, I never said anything like that, and people who know me know I wouldn't have said it. Regardless of whether or not Elvis Presley actually used racist slurs or made racist comments, he certainly got rich working as a white performer co-opting African-American music. After all, his hit song Hound Dog, for example, released in 1956, is so closely associated with Presley that many probably assume it's an Elvis original. However, Big Mama Thornton first recorded the song in 1952. It was a smash on the R&B chart, staying in the number one position for seven weeks. But Presley's version topped the Billboard pop charts four times in 1956, sold more than 10 million copies, and is one of the best-selling singles of all time. David Pilgrim thinks backlash from this cultural appropriation likely has something to do with the persistent rumors about Presley being a racist. He wrote in 2006, While talented black entertainers labored in smaller venues, sometimes in relative obscurity, Presley became a wealthy and famous international star, so some blacks resent his success and him, and this made a story about him using a racist remark believable. Elvis Presley's final concert wasn't meant to be his last. The singer was only 42 years old and was scheduled to go on tour again shortly after his untimely passing. But a lifetime of fried peanut butter, bacon, and banana sandwiches, accompanied by a decades-long indulgence in narcotics, brought the King's career and life to an unexpected end. The last live show that Presley ever performed occurred in 1977. The day was June 26th. 
a date that kept popping up in Elvis history. It was his manager, Colonel Tom Parker's birthday. Plus, according to Rolling Stone, Elvis was first called to the Sun Records office on June 26, 1954. Three years to the day after that, he spent his first night at Graceland. On June 26, 1979, Elvis's father died of heart failure. What could it all mean? It's all connected. A web of conspiracy that goes all the way to the top. Well, probably not. Regardless, on the night in question, Elvis was on the tail end of an arduous nine-day tour. His last concert would be performed for a packed crowd at the Market Square Arena in Indianapolis. Per the Indiana Historical Bureau, nearly 18,000 people attended, none of whom realized that they were witnessing history. For seven years, warm-up comedian Jackie Kahane held the unenviable responsibility of getting up on stage before the man known as The King took over. It was no easy job, and he was even booed off the stage at New York City's Madison Square Garden. Kahane's job as Elvis's opening act even dominated the first half of his obituary in the Los Angeles Times when the comedian died in 2001. In it, the Times describes how Kahane's set, formerly a tight 18 minutes, had stretched to nearly 45 as the years wore on and it took longer for Elvis to get into performance shape each night. That night in Indianapolis, Kahane announced to the crowd, Elvis looks great and Elvis sounds great. So he may have been a good comedian, but he definitely wasn't a prophet. Nevertheless, as Kahane left the stage that night, few could have predicted things would come to an end for the king quite so abruptly. If you're wondering how much it cost to see Elvis Presley on the night of his death, it was only $15 a ticket, or just over $65 in modern dollars adjusted for inflation. Even more surprisingly, tickets were still available for purchase the evening before the concert, per the Indiana History blog quite the bargain for an up-close look at one of the era's defining stars. Aside from Kahane, that evening's opening acts included a brass band and some soul singers. In fact, those openers performed for almost an hour and a half before fans would catch sight of the man they'd all been waiting for. The Indianapolis Star noted that for the Monday evening performance, Elvis had donned the now iconic white and gold jumpsuit, maybe to better facilitate the dance moves that still drove the audience wild. Of particular note to the reviewer, Elvis had limited his karate moves that evening, but nevertheless bounded on stage to kick off the show with a rendition of C.C. Ryder, and still threw in a few of his signature leg jerks from his early days. For fans, it was a remarkable performance, especially given how difficult 1977 had been thus far for the king. According to Far Out magazine, Elvis had broken up with a long-term girlfriend, immediately became involved with a new woman, and was so out of it during some earlier performances that journalist Tony Sherman recounted how he'd been nearly impossible to understand at an earlier show in Louisiana. Despite that, the King rallied and got things together for that one evening in June, if only briefly. Critical reception for Elvis's final show was decidedly mixed. On the negative side, there was Zach Duncan's review, which called the concert tacky and outdated, with the lighting merely adequate and the extensive use of warm-up acts coming off as fluff. He claimed that announcements were made over the PA system three times throughout the concert, reminding folks to check out the merch stand, with a voice even taking the extra step of reading the price tags of the available souvenirs. There were also more positive reviews, like the one in the Indianapolis Star, which spent a significant amount of time pointing out that Elvis wasn't as fat as he could have been. Over the course of a three-hour concert, Elvis spent just an hour and 20 minutes on stage, performing old standards as well as new numbers, including a cover of Simon & Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. At the end of the show, Presley brought his father on stage to wave to the crowd, then sang his hit song, Can't Help Falling In Love With You. Afterward, he told the audience, We'll meet you again. God bless. Adios. And then the show was over, and Elvis left the building for the very last time. Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash, two sides of a love triangle? These two music icons have more in common than you might think. This is the truth about their friendship. 706 Union Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee marks the spot of what could be called the birthplace of rock and roll, or at least the place that brought rock and roll into the mainstream. According to The National, it all began in 1954, when a 19-year-old Elvis Presley performed Arthur Crudup's That's All Right for Sam Phillips, founder of Sun Records. That same year, Johnny Cash performed gospel songs in an audition for Phillips, who told him to quote, go home and sin, then come back with a song I can sell. 
By the end of 1954, Presley and Cash were both signed to the label. Sun Records president John Singleton told The National, I can't say for sure what pop music would sound like today without a Sun Records in the 50s, but there may not have been a Beatles or Rolling Stones. I believe it would be hard to find a successful rock artist who was not a fan of Sun. The first time Cash met Presley, Elvis was performing from the flatbed of a truck to sing for a couple hundred people at a drugstore opening. At that time, he had only released one single and was left with no choice but to play the same two songs, his only songs, on a loop. It wasn't much of a show, so Presley invited Cash and his wife Vivian to see his next concert. It didn't go much better. Cash wrote in Cash, the autobiography, the date was a blunder because the place was an adult club where teenagers weren't welcome, and so Vivian and I were two of only a dozen or so patrons, 15 at the most. All the same, I thought Elvis was great. He didn't say much. He didn't have to, of course. His charisma alone kept everyone's attention. Still, Cash came away impressed, especially with Presley's underrated rhythm guitar playing. Cash could see that Elvis was destined for greater things. Throughout his life, Johnny Cash felt a certain loyalty to the Elvis Presley he knew in the 1950s. He wrote in Cash the autobiography that he much preferred Presley's music when they first met over his popular later work, which Cash thought was overproduced. My Elvis was the Elvis of the 50s. He was a kid when I worked with him. He was 19 years old and he loved cheeseburgers, girls, and his mother. Not necessarily in that order. It was more like his mother than girls than cheeseburgers. Personally, I liked cheeseburgers and I had nothing against his mother, but the girls were the thing. He had so many girls after him that whenever he was working with us, there were always plenty left over. We had a lot of fun. Presley, his rock and roll songs, and his hip shaking famously drew hordes of enthusiastic girls, but Cash emphasized in his biography that Presley's stardom was built on more than sex appeal. Elvis was so good. Every show I did with him, I never missed the chance to stand in the wings and watch. We all did. He was that charismatic. In the mid-1950s, June Carter of the country trio The Carter Sisters went on tour with Elvis. Presley took to playing Cash's music on the road. In her 1987 autobiography, From the Heart, Carter recalled a time when Presley was trying to tune his guitar and sing Cash's early hit, Cry, Cry, Cry. Carter recalled saying, quote, I don't know this Johnny Cash, to which Presley replied, Oh, you'll know Cash. The whole world will know Johnny Cash. He's a friend of mine. In June 1956, Carter and Cash finally met at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. Carter wrote, Johnny Cash took me by the hand and said, I've always wanted to meet you. The strangest feeling came over me. I was afraid to look him in the eyes. It was one of the things I did best. I never stammered and still found myself not able to say much of anything. I think I finally blurted out, I feel like I know you already. Elvis plays you on the jukebox all the time and he can't tune his guitar without humming cry, cry, cry. Now he's got me doing it. In 2008, John Carter Cash, the son of Johnny Cash and June Carter, released the biography Anchored in Love, an intimate portrait of June Carter Cash. In the book, John addressed speculation that June may have had an affair with Elvis Presley. He wrote, Throughout my life, I would see my mom get a mischievous twinkle in her eye whenever she mentioned Elvis Presley. Her eyes would flash merrily and she would say, You know, son, your father was always jealous of Elvis. She even told me once that she sometimes wondered what would have happened if she had fallen in love with Elvis. John Carter Cash speculated that there may have been more to his mother's speculation than idle fancy. He wrote, Though mom always maintained that she never had an affair with Elvis, Carl Smith, her first husband, believed differently and perhaps for good reason. After Carl moved out of their Madison home, mom would sometimes let Elvis stay at the house to rest after a tour. On December 4, 1956, singer-songwriter Carl Perkins headed to Memphis's Sun Studio for a recording session. A pre-famed Jerry Lee Lewis was there on keys, and by pure coincidence, Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash both stopped by the studio. The foursome then played a 23-song blend of gospel, bluegrass, and contemporary hits, including Presley's own Love Me Tender and Don't Be Cruel. Recognizing the unusual and now historic nature of this meeting of musical minds, Sun Records founder Sam Phillips alerted the Memphis Press Scimitar. The paper ran the story the following day, complete with a photo of the four musicians captioned The Million Dollar Quartet. Cash describes the session in Cash the Autobiography writing, I was the first to arrive and the last to leave, contrary to what has been written. 
I was just there to watch Carl record, which he did until mid-afternoon when Elvis came in with his girlfriend. At that point, the session stopped and we all started laughing and cutting up together. Then Elvis sat down at the piano and we started singing gospel songs we all knew. Though some have said that Cash can't be heard in the recordings, he wrote that this isn't true. Contrary to what some people have written, my voice is on the tape. It's not obvious because I was farthest away from the mic and I was singing a lot higher than I usually did in order to stay in key with Elvis, but I guarantee you, I'm there. In 1959, Johnny Cash opened for Elvis Presley on a live tour. He began with a slapstick, hip-swiveling Elvis impression and a rendition of the King's 1958 hit Heartbreak Hotel. Then when Presley would enter the stage, he would take his turn impersonating the man in black. Presley's Cash impression reportedly traveled offstage and on the road. According to Chuck Crisofulli in George Klein's 2010 book, Elvis, My Best Man, Radio Days, Rock and Roll Nights, and My Lifelong Friendship with Elvis Presley. During Presley's 1957 tour, he was riding a train when a teenage girl approached him, greeted him with an excited Johnny Cash, and asked him to sing one of his, Cash's, songs. Klein wrote, Elvis would never sing one of his own songs in that type of situation, but for this little Johnny Cash fan, he dropped his voice to its lowest note and started singing a few lines of Hey Porter, a song Cash had cut at Sun that seemed especially appropriate for a midnight train ride. The girl was thrilled and even ended up with an autograph from Elvis which read, Best Wishes Johnny Cash. The level of stardom that Elvis Presley experienced inevitably came with its share of scrutiny, and although Presley was eager to shake his hips on the world stage, he had a hard time with criticism of any kind, and particularly the rumors about him using drugs, as Johnny Cash noted in Cash the Autobiography. Presley was very sensitive, easily hurt by the stories people told about him being on dope and so on. I myself couldn't understand why people wanted to say that back in the 50s, because in those days he was the last person on earth who needed dope. He had such a high energy level that it seemed he'd never stop, though maybe that's why they said he was on dope. Cash went on to say that as far as he knew, there was no basis to the rumors. I never saw any evidence of it. I never saw him use any kind of drug or even alcohol. He was always clear-headed around me and very pleasant. Cash himself didn't see Presley as a bad boy or a contentious figure at all. He wrote, Elvis was such a nice guy and so talented and charismatic. He had it all that some people just couldn't handle it and reacted with jealousy. It's only human, I suppose, but it's sad. Beyond the 1950s, Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash went their separate ways. In 2020, Cash's son John Carter Cash told Express, Elvis went on to make his films and some more music later on and they never worked again together after the 1950s. Cash explained why in Cash the Autobiography. He wrote, He and I liked each other, but we weren't that tight. I was older than he was for one thing and married for another, and we weren't close at all in his later years. I took the hint when he closed his world around him. I didn't try to invade his privacy. I'm so glad I didn't either, because so many of his old friends were embarrassed so badly when they were turned away at Graceland. In the 1960s and 70s, Cash's occasional interactions with Presley were positive, but professional, and conducted from a distance. Cash recalled in his book, he and I chatted on the phone a couple of times and swapped notes now and again. If he were closing at the Las Vegas Hilton as I was getting ready to open, he'd wish me luck, that kind of thing but that was about the extent of it. Elvis Presley died on August 16, 1977 at the age of 42. That December, Johnny Cash recorded the Johnny Cash Christmas Special, which included an all-star tribute to the King. He was joined by the other two members of the Million Dollar Quartet, Carl Perkins and Jerry Lee Lewis, as well as fellow Sun Records star Roy Orbison. The group then performed the gospel standard, This Train is Bound for Glory in Presley's honor with Cash saying, He was a star, and he always was a star. Because all of us remember him and how he loved gospel songs and how we liked him, this song is for Elvis. The special also included performances of three songs that Presley had recorded. Cash teamed up with the quartet, the Statler Brothers, to perform Blue Christmas, a song Presley popularized in 1957. Perkins performed Blue Suede Shoes, which he wrote and initially recorded in 1955, before Elvis covered it in 1956. Lewis performed Whole Lot of Shaking Going On, which he popularized in 1957, and Presley covered in 1971. 
Johnny Cash was known for transcending the boundaries of genre and getting crowds, ranging from devout Christians to prison inmates, on their feet. But by 1988, after three decades of touring with countless rock and roll icons, Cash had his own idea of which artist had the best stage presence, the king himself. Cash said during a 1988 interview on The Late Late Show, The best performer, probably Elvis Presley. I don't think anybody could touch him. Cash expounded on just why Elvis stood out from the rest, saying he had a lot of rhythm, he was a very good singer, and he was a fabulous performer in the way he moved the people. And uh, not only the girls loved Elvis, but every man backstage was standing in the wings watching Elvis. He had that charisma. One thing is certain, we'll never see the likes of Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley again. The sudden death of Elvis Presley shocked the whole world. But just how did he die? How has his post-mortem report raised eyebrows? And what mysteries lie behind the King's secret private autopsy? Keep watching to find out. Elvis Presley is practically a mythic figure in pop culture, and as such, legends and lore surround both his life and his death. The circumstances of Presley's untimely death in 1977, at just 42 years of age, have long been debated. The official story, though, and the one accepted by most people, is that Elvis Presley died in the bathroom of Graceland, his famous home in Memphis, Tennessee. Good evening. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently, it was a heart attack. A brief two-page medical examiner's report, completed after Presley's death, can be found in the public record. This document appears to be dated October 20th, 1977, more than two months after Presley's death on August 16th. It was completed by Shelby County Medical Examiner Dr. Jerry Francisco and shed some light on how Elvis was found. The report also reveals some cursory information about Elvis's death. An autopsy was performed as well. It wasn't ordered by the district attorney general, however, but by Elvis's father, Vernon Presley. The results of the autopsy were then sealed until the 50th anniversary of his son's death. The public report features some basic information about Presley, including his full name, Elvis Aaron Presley, and his address, which was 3764 Elvis Presley Boulevard, otherwise known as Graceland. Also listed are his race, sex, and age and the agency investigating his death, Shelby County Medical Examiner and Memphis Police Department. More unusual is the fact that some pertinent physical information is notably absent from the report. While Presley's eyes and brown hair are noted, as his lack of facial hair, the fields for weight, length, body temperature, and date and time were all left blank. It's well known that toward the end of his life, Presley put on a significant amount of weight, with some estimates suggesting he weighed in at 350 pounds. An exact figure for Elvis's weight could have perhaps shed some light on one of the rumored factors in Elvis's death, constipation. This condition was a very real problem for Elvis, and he received enemas and laxatives daily to deal with it. It's rumored that Elvis had what is known as a megacolon, which was filled with impacted material. Dr. Francisco lists Elvis Presley's manner of death as natural, and there are some additional details that point to a probable cause of death. By the time the medical examiner took a look at Elvis's body, he had reached the stage of rigor mortis, a stiffening of the deceased's joints and muscles that can sometimes shed some light on whether a body was moved after death. The next spot in the report is for liver or liver color, which Dr. Francisco marked with an indistinct letter, along with a check mark in the fixed box. The liver color marked on the death report likely refers to liver mortis, which has to do with how the blood pools in the body after death. This can help determine the time of death, as liver mortis becomes fixed after 8 to 12 hours. It can also help medical examiners determine the cause of death as well. In the section of the report labeled Marks and Wounds, it is noted that Elvis had congestion to face and upper torso. Additionally, diagrams note that Elvis had a pressure mark near his left eye and sutured thoracotomy on the left side of his abdomen. The medical examiner also listed a probable cause of death, HCVD, associated with ASHD. This is shorthand for hypertensive cardiovascular disease associated with arteriosclerotic heart disease. The medical examiner's report also shed some light on how Elvis was found and the situation surrounding his death. Elvis was reportedly last seen alive at 8 a.m. on the morning of August 16, 1977. He was found in his home at 2 p.m., and the police were notified at 3.30. His time of death is listed at 3.30, and it's noted that Presley was dead on arrival at Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis. The person who found Elvis was his girlfriend, Ginger Alden, and the report includes a note that Alden found him on the floor of dressing room. It's now widely known, however, 
but she found him in the bathroom of his master bedroom. The report also notes that an autopsy was performed at Baptist Memorial Hospital. This autopsy had become a point of contention over the years, however, because Vernon Presley chose for it to remain sealed. It is set to be opened in 2027. Few, if any, figures in rock and roll history are as timeless or controversial as Elvis Presley. Both a rebel and a heartthrob, Elvis changed the way the world thought about music, pop culture, and celebrity. Here's what the last 12 months of Elvis' life were like. The last person to see Elvis Presley alive, and the person who heard his last words, was Ginger Alden, the singer's fiancé. Alden was just 20 years old at the time, half the age of her partner, per the Sydney Morning Herald. Alden had given two slightly conflicting reports about the last words ever spoken by the king of rock and roll, but neither quote is of much significance. Elvis' last words might have been, I'm going to the bathroom to read. Or, in response to Alden's admonition for him to not fall asleep in the lavatory, Elvis reportedly replied, I won't. The last thing Elvis said to me, uh, I told him not to fall asleep in the bathroom, and he said, I won't. Alden had reason to be concerned, as her fiancé had insomnia, which he tried to overcome through strong sedatives, as reported by the Los Angeles Times. It was early in the morning of August 16, 1977, when Elvis slipped out of the bedroom and headed for the bathroom and Alden went back to sleep. She would remain asleep until the early afternoon, when she found her partner cold on the bathroom floor. Fortunately for Presley's legacy, he left behind 18 number one hit songs in the Billboard charts, and he's better remembered for his music than for his final words. The book Elvis Presley took along with him to the bathroom on the last morning of his life was Frank Adams' A Scientific Search for the Face of Jesus, which had been published five years prior. The book is focused on the Shroud of Turin, the piece of fabric purported to have been laid across the face and body of Jesus after his crucifixion. Most modern scholars, scientists, and forensic experts now doubt the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. Carbon dating shows it is likely from sometime between 1260 and 1390 AD, well after the purported lifetime of Christ, but the Shroud remains an object of wonder today, just as it was in the 1970s. Presley had maintained a Christian faith throughout his life, apparently being twice baptized while alive and once posthumously, according to USA Today. He was also keenly interested in religion in general, often practicing meditation and wearing both a cross and a Star of David at times, as Elvis had Jewish ancestry on his mother's side. According to USA Today, not long before his death, he may even have been considering a conversion to Mormonism. Around 5 a.m. on the morning of August 16, 1977, Elvis Presley and fiancé Ginger Alden went to bed together after spending much of the night awake, despite Elvis trying to nod off with the aid of various prescription drugs, according to the Express. At 7 a.m., Elvis apparently took another round of pills, desperate to get some rest given that he was slated to fly to Maine that evening, before a concert the next day, and then continue on a tour around the nation. Still unable to sleep, Elvis left his bedroom, saying his last words to Alden at around 9.30 a.m. Alden fell back asleep and remained slumbering until shortly before 1.30 p.m. Awaking to find herself alone in bed, Alden went to look for her fiancé. Approximately four hours had elapsed since the last time anyone had seen Presley alive, and it's entirely possible that he had slipped into unconsciousness in the middle of the morning, thus spending the last few hours of his life alone and incapacitated. Ginger Alden, Presley's young model fiancé, found Elvis on the bathroom floor that afternoon in August. According to Memphis Magazine, she went to the bathroom door and called his name. When there was no answer, she entered and found him lying face down on the bathroom carpet. There are conflicting accounts as to how Alden found her partner. Memphis Magazine shares that Presley had been sitting in a lounging chair in the bathroom and that he had evidently lost consciousness and slipped out of the seat and onto the floor of the room. The more indelicate version of the story, and the one more commonly repeated, is that Alden found Elvis on the floor of the bathroom, him having slipped off the toilet after losing consciousness. It's well known that Presley had constipation issues due to a terrible diet, consisting largely of unhealthy foods and his heavy use of medications, as described by the Mirror. But then again, in my mind, there are a lot of unanswered questions. In the moments after Ginger Alden found Elvis Presley lying on the floor, she tried to revive her partner. Alden later described how she touched Presley's skin and found it cold, though he may have still been alive. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Alden said, I slapped him a few times and it was like he breathed once when I turned his head. I couldn't move him. Alden summoned Joseph Esposito, a friend of Presley's from his days in the United States Army, who had come to serve the singer as both a personal and professional manager. Esposito attempted to revive Presley with rudimentary first aid while awaiting an ambulance. Presley was then rushed to the nearby hospital, but it was already too late. His road manager tried to revive him. He failed. A hospital tried to revive him. It failed. 
Elvis Presley was officially pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m. on August 16, 1977. He had been taken to Baptist Memorial Hospital, a few miles from his Graceland mansion, and it was there that the official pronouncement was made. However, it's likely that he died much earlier, perhaps even several hours before. By 4 p.m. that day, word had gotten out to the public that the king of rock and roll had expired, and the news quickly spread across the nation and the globe. According to Country Music Nation, within hours of the death announcement, thousands of fans gathered outside of Elvis's Graceland mansion. Some traveled hundreds of miles to be there, feeling compelled to be at the place where Elvis spent his final moments. At Graceland, around the nation and across the world, people expressed shock, sorrow, and in many cases, disbelief. Theories that the news was a hoax and that Elvis had not actually died persisted for decades, and some fans even believe that he is still alive today. Conspiracy theories include the idea that the singer faked his own death to escape public attention and the notion that it was a cover-up to help the king of rock and roll escape the mafia and that he went into witness protection. On the day of Presley's death, the mayor of Memphis ordered flags in the city to be flown at half-staff. And by the next day, the news was making headlines all around the world. Even though Presley was far past the peak of his fame when he died in 1977, he was still very much an icon. His death dominated the news cycle for days after his passing. Soon enough, much of the world moved on to other things, but many die-hard fans would mourn their lost hero for years to come. I miss that we didn't get to see where he was going to go and, and you know, hear more of his music. At the time of his death, the famously handsome Elvis Presley was overweight, plagued by insomnia, and regularly taking a cocktail of pills. He was reportedly consuming thousands of calories per day and living off a diet of burgers and a sandwich of his own invention that included bacon and bananas, according to ABC Science. Despite being just 42 at the time of his death, he had high blood pressure and had been hospitalized for intestinal blockage, according to the Washington Post. The multiple drugs that Presley often took also wreaked havoc on his mental health. According to The Express, in the summer of 1977, Presley called the White House and managed to get recently elected President Jimmy Carter on the phone. Carter later said of the call, he was totally stoned and didn't know what he was saying. His sentences were almost incoherent. I talked to him for a long time to ease Presley out of his paranoid delusions, calming his fears that he was being shadowed by sinister forces and that his friend was being framed. Presley would reportedly call the White House many more times in the weeks before his death, but was never again put through to the Commander-in-Chief. The official cause of the death of Elvis Presley on August 16, 1977 was heart failure, but the cardiac incident that led to the King's death was reportedly no random fluke, but rather a direct result of his heavy use and serious abuse of a myriad of medications, chiefly sedatives, barbiturates, and opiates. Per town and country, when the toxicology report of the performer's blood came back from analysis several weeks after his death, it reportedly contained high dosages of, among other things, the opiates Dilodid, Percodan, and Demerol, as well as Quaaludes and Codeine. They reported traces of 10 separate drugs. However, shortly after his death, Tennessee's chief medical examiner Jerry Francisco said of Presley, had these drugs not been there, he still would have died. Presley had been misusing pills for years, and more heavily so in the last year and a half of his life. It was reported by people that Elvis's personal physician, Dr. George Nicopolis, known simply as Dr. Nick, had reportedly provided his patient with as many as 12,000 pills in the 18 months before Presley died. The doctor later claimed that the pills were intended to be shared among Presley's entire entourage, but it's likely he knew exactly where they would go. Several years later, the doctor would have his medical license temporarily suspended, and he faced 11 felony counts of overprescribing drugs in 1981, but was acquitted. Dr. Nick was finally permanently suspended from practice by the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners in 1995, nearly 20 years after the death of his most famous patient. The body of Elvis Presley is buried at Graceland, his beloved home in Memphis, Tennessee. His grave is flanked by the burial sites of his grandmother, Minnie Mae Presley, who died in May 1980, his father, Vernon Elvis Presley, who died less than two years after his son, passing in June 1979, and his mother, Gladys Presley, who died in 1958. The graves are in the Meditation Garden, and according to the official Graceland website, millions of fans from around the world have come to Graceland to pay their respects to Elvis. Elvis Presley's funeral took place on August 18, 1977, two days after his death. Though the actual ceremony was not a lavish affair and was attended by a small, select group of mourners, thousands of Elvis fans converged on Memphis in the 48 hours after his passing. The crowds were so large that, according to Live About, President Carter ordered 300 National Guard troops to the area to maintain order. 
Despite being one of the most famous and successful musicians of all time, Elvis Presley was not all that wealthy at the time of his death. According to The Express, Presley had a net worth of around $5 million at the time of his death, which would equate to approximately $21 million today. How is it that the man with 18 number one hit singles and multiple beloved movies who toured the nation and was known around the world was worth so relatively little when he died? Quite simply, it's because Presley spent so much money. From furnishing his Graceland mansion in lavish style, to owning two private jets, to keeping a huge staff on salary, to his own massive appetites for foods and drugs, Elvis had a lifestyle that cost a lot of money. He also spent freely on friends and family, and had agreed to provide his ex-wife, Priscilla Presley, with 5% of his significant publishing rights, The Express reported. However, his estate is worth a huge amount today. In 2020, Cheat Sheet reported, Elvis's estate is still so profitable four decades after his death that he's the fifth highest paid dead celebrity of 2020. And as it turns out, his estate made more money this year than the singer had the year he died. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Elvis Presley entertained millions throughout his brief but iconic career as the king of rock and roll. Throughout his music career, however, Elvis's shady and distrustful manager Colonel Tom Parker was secretly calling the shots. Here's the truth about Elvis Presley's manager. One of the most surprising things about Colonel Tom Parker is that he wasn't an American and that his real name wasn't Tom Parker. Parker was actually born in the city of Breda in the Netherlands, making him Dutch. His real name was Andreas van Kwok. While he was still in his teens, Andreas fled the Netherlands by ship, arriving in Canada and making his way to Hoboken, New Jersey. He worked with traveling carnivals and eventually got into music promotion, changing his name to Tom Parker and erasing any mention of his true origins. Parker entered the country illegally and never took any steps to correct his status, despite the fact that it would have been relatively easy to do so. As Smithsonian Magazine points out, the Alien Registration Act of 1940 basically offered amnesty to all illegal aliens, so becoming a naturalized citizen would have been pretty easy. And even if there were difficulties, by the 1960s, Parker was rich and famous and probably had the connections to get any problems smoothed out. Yet he never bothered and thus remained an illegal immigrant his entire life. Colonel Tom Parker put a lot of effort into hiding his true identity and his past. As Smithsonian Magazine reports, he even went so far as to create an elaborate fake past for himself. He claimed to have been born in Huntington, West Virginia. I was born in West Virginia in the U.S. of A. He maintained that his name was Thomas Andrew Parker and was happy to imply that his apparent rank of colonel stemmed from his service in the Army before World War II. None of this was true. Parker did serve in the Army but only attained the rank of private. His rank of colonel was ceremonial, bestowed on him by the governor of Louisiana in 1948 as a reward for his efforts on the governor's election campaign. What's truly remarkable about Colonel Parker's deception is how long it lasted. Parker became one of the most famous people in the world, amassed a fortune, and negotiated huge deals on Presley's behalf often making business enemies as he went due to his hard-nosed style. Yet, no one ever thought to investigate the colonel's past. The truth of his life didn't come out until Parker was in his 70s and Presley was long dead. After immigrating illegally to the United States from the Netherlands in the 1920s, Colonel Tom Parker eventually joined the U.S. Army in 1929. He served two years without incident and then re-enlisted in 1931. His second stint in the Army didn't go so well. Parker walked off his post and was officially declared absent without leave or AWOL in 1932. He was quickly arrested and spent a few months in military prison. Parker's stay in prison was harsh and he was kept in solitary confinement for months. This took a mental toll on him. As the New York Times notes, Parker was eventually discharged from the Army, but only after suffering some sort of breakdown. The Washington Post reports that he spent several months recuperating at Walter Reed Army Hospital and was officially diagnosed as being in a, quote, constitutional psychopathic state. Parker was released from the armed forces that year. When World War II erupted, plunging the whole world into bloody conflict, the U.S. Army needed a lot of men in a very short time, and most people were more than willing to step up and answer the draft. Plenty of men of all ages chose not to wait for the draft and volunteered for service. As a veteran, Parker would have been an ideal choice for the draft, but Parker's first experience with the Army had ended with desertion, which left him with little apparent desire to repeat the experience, especially if it involved leaving the country and being shot at. Parker had apparently had all he could take of Army life and took steps to avoid serving his adopted country. Those steps mostly involved eating. Even in wartime, the Army has some strict standards about the physical condition of its soldiers, so Parker's brilliant plan to avoid the draft involved gaining weight. 
The plan was a resounding success for Parker. He soon weighed around 300 pounds, more than enough to be classified morbidly obese and unfit for service. Colonel Tom Parker had swagger. As the manager of the biggest musical star in the world, he could afford to bluster, often bragging about being in charge of Presley's career while earning the lion's share of the income. But Parker was also a very scared man who sacrificed millions of potential earnings because he didn't have a passport and was afraid to let Presley tour overseas without him. Despite being a superstar, Elvis Presley only toured outside the U.S. three times, all in 1957 and all in Canada. And notably, Parker did not accompany Presley on the trip because he feared that he'd be exposed as an illegal immigrant with an assumed name. After that, Parker consistently turned down offers for Presley to tour in Europe and Japan, deals often worth millions of dollars. As the Washington Post notes, British music promoter Harvey Goldsmith said flat out that when he tried to sign Presley to a performance in England, Parker told him privately it would never happen because he was afraid to leave the U.S. The Washington Post also reminds us that this cost Presley, whose estate was worth just $7 million when he died, a great deal of money. If Parker hadn't been so paranoid about Presley being outside of his direct control, the king would have earned millions more. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding Colonel Tom Parker is his extreme paranoia and secrecy. It's true he was an illegal immigrant living under an assumed name and therefore had a legitimate reason to worry about any involvement with law enforcement. However, as Smithsonian Magazine points out, he could have cleared up his immigration status fairly easily. So why was he so worried about his true identity coming out? Possibly because he was a murderer. As writer Alana Nash notes, a reporter in Parker's home country of the Netherlands received an anonymous letter stating that Parker murdered the wife of a greengrocer on the Bosstadt, a shopping and residential area in Breda. And in fact, there is an unsolved murder in Bosstadt that fits the timeline of Parker's movements. In 1929, a woman named Anna van den Enden was beaten to death behind her husband's grocery store. The crime scene showed evidence of a search for money and valuables, and an effort had been made to obscure physical evidence. There's no way to know if the man who would become Elvis's manager was Anna van den Enden's killer. The police investigation uncovered no clues, and it's impossible to place Parker in any specific place in 1929. But it certainly would explain Parker's hurried exit from his home country and his fevered secrecy and worry over his true identity. Promoting the world's biggest musical act isn't the most difficult job. Elvis Presley was one of the most in-demand artists in the world, and the offers poured in to Colonel Tom Parker no matter what he did. Yet Parker soaked Elvis for an enormous amount of money. As the Washington Post notes, by 1966, Parker was earning 50% of Elvis's paychecks. And in 1973, Parker sold the rights to Presley's recording catalog to RCA for a low-ball $5.4 million. One reason Parker needed all that money was his gambling. Additionally, as the Daily Express reports, Parker may have contributed to Presley's early death by pushing the singer to perform two shows a night, seven days a week, for his Las Vegas residencies in order to keep the cash flowing. So I did my part, Elvis did his show, and we were lucky. Great talent, and we had a great show and a lot of fun. With Elvis in Las Vegas, Parker ran up enormous debts with the casinos and was focused on keeping Presley working constantly so he could cover his debts. Elvis's decline during this period is obvious. The physical and mental strain of playing every night drove Elvis to severely abuse several prescription medications. He gained weight and looked awful, sweating through his rhinestone jumpsuits. Elvis was known for many things, launching rock and roll into the mainstream, scandalizing folks with his hip gyrations, rhinestone-studded jumpsuits, and some really, really awful movies. Colonel Tom Parker signed Elvis to these terrible films for a simple reason. They made tons of money, $2.2 billion in domestic gross alone. Add in the soundtrack royalties and the free publicity for Elvis records, and it's easy to see why Parker ignored his clients' pleas for better scripts. And those better scripts were out there and were offered to Presley. However, Parker turned down opportunities for Presley to star in several films that went on to be huge hits and establish their actors as legitimate stars. Elvis could have played the lead in West Side Story, for example, or the role that made John Voight a star in Midnight Cowboy. He was also offered the Chris Christopherson role in the 1976 version of A Star is Born. Parker turned down all these roles because he preferred the safe money of Elvis' recordings and live shows. He was also very protective of Presley's current image. But trapping Presley in films of lesser and lesser quality not only frustrated the king, but also meant that while rock music was being revolutionized by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, Elvis Presley was singing songs like Yoga Is As Yoga Does. Elvis Presley was huge. It was estimated that the rock and roll icon earned as much as a billion dollars over the course of his career. As the Los Angeles Times points out, his manager Colonel Tom Parker knew that Elvis' brand was so powerful that he could earn millions at any moment simply by booking a tour, recording an album, or appearing in a film. And for every dollar Elvis earned, Tom Parker took a piece. 
That's standard. Most managers earn between 10 and 15% of what their clients make. But from the very beginning, Parker bilked his only client for more. Their original contract gave Parker an unheard of 25% of Presley's earnings, and he was eventually getting an astounding 50%. The new contract also allowed Parker to charge additional fees for services he provided, eating away at the money that should have gone to Elvis instead. Eventually, this uneven arrangement led to a truly incredible scenario. Elvis Presley's manager made more money than Elvis himself. As the Washington Post notes, in 1973, Parker sold the rights to Presley's recording catalog to RCA for a measly $5.4 million and earned $1.5 million more than Presley in the deal. Andreas Van Kwok kept up his false identity for decades, but eventually at least part of the truth caught up with him. In 1981, Albert Goldman published a biography of Elvis Presley that was pretty scathing in its portrayal of Parker, while exposing his true identity to the world. At the same time, Parker was being sued by Priscilla Presley, and his dubious financial and ethical behavior towards one of the world's most beloved performers was being detailed. Parker began to worry that he might be charged with crime stemming from any number of these misdeeds, and suddenly decided to flip the script on his illegal entry into the United States in the 1920s. In order to slow down incoming criminal charges, Parker officially claimed that he was a citizen of no nation, and thus not subject to any country's laws. His reasoning was that he'd served in the U.S. military without permission from the Dutch government, and thus had forfeited his Dutch citizenship. Since he'd never been naturalized as a U.S. citizen either, he wasn't a subject of either country. The theory was never tested. Parker lived in increasing illness and obscurity following Elvis' death in 1977, mostly coasting on his affiliation with the late king. Parker died in 1997, 87 years old and having gambled away most of his money. Did you know Elvis Presley had a twin brother? What happened to him, and how has he spurred fan conspiracy theories? Keep watching for the answers. Countless biographies and documentaries have purported to tell Elvis's full story in the 40 years since Presley's death in 1977, so you'd think there wouldn't be that much left to tell about the erstwhile king of rock and roll. Yet he continues to captivate fans and spur curiosity about his offstage life. Presley had a close relationship with his parents, particularly his mother, Gladys Presley. In his book about the album, From Elvis in Memphis, author Eric Wolfson explains that he may have loved his mother even more than any of his girlfriends, a sentiment echoed by Presley's wife, Priscilla Presley. Elvis didn't grow up in a lavish home like the Graceland mansion he eventually purchased after gaining fame. His father, Vernon Presley, worked pretty much any job he could to support his family in the 1930s. All that's interesting quotes him as saying, There was almost nobody poorer than my wife Gladys and me. Unfortunately, Vernon spent some time separated from the family in the late 1930s after being arrested for check forgery. He sold a hog, but the buyer underpaid him, so he changed the amount on the check. He got caught over the forgery and spent eight months in jail. This obviously did nothing to help the Presley family's financial situation. Gladys and Elvis had to move in with relatives during those months. After Elvis was born in 1935, he and his parents regularly attended church services that included gospel music. Elvis fell in love with it. Vernon and Gladys were both supportive of Elvis's burgeoning interest in music as he grew up. Elvis was devastated when Gladys passed away in 1958 due to liver problems and hepatitis. But Vernon stayed close with Elvis throughout his career, even helping with his son's earnings and regularly spending time on tour with him. My land joined his. I live right at his back doors. So we're still together. One lesser known reason for Elvis Presley's close relationship with his parents had to do with his identical twin brother. Presley had a twin brother named Jesse Garen Presley, who died at birth. In Last Train to Memphis, The Rise of Elvis Presley, biographer Peter Goralnik claimed that Gladys Presley said, When one twin died, the one that lived got all the strength of both. According to All That's Interesting, Vernon Presley said he felt that God intended for Elvis to be. Quote, the only child we'd ever need. Jesse has been the subject of fan conspiracy theories for decades. One claims that Jesse did not die at birth and was instead a body double for Elvis at various appearances. For example, in footage from a 1970 interview, fans have pointed out inconsistencies with Elvis's eye color and mannerisms to support their theory that Jesse was actually doing the interview. Conspiracy theorists also use the incorrect date on Jesse Presley's death certificate as further proof he didn't die at birth. The certificate states his date of death as January 7, 1935, though he and Elvis Presley were actually born on January 8. The theorists believe the incorrect date is the result of a cover-up. This is hardly the only strange conspiracy theory that has followed Elvis. 
just like Tupac and Michael Jackson. Many fans believe that Elvis is still alive, or at least that he didn't die in 1977. There's a Facebook group with over 30,000 followers dedicated to proving this. The theory about Jesse is a common topic of discussion within the group as well. Conspiracies aside, Find a Grave reports that Jesse was buried in a shoebox next to his uncle in Tupelo, Mississippi, the Presley's hometown. In Graceland, Jesse has a cenotaph next to Elvis's grave. Their parents, Gladys and Vernon, grandmother Minnie Mae, and Elvis's grandson Benjamin are also buried at Graceland. Elvis's living relatives include his only child, Lisa Marie Presley, and her remaining children, actress Riley Keough and twins Harper and Finley Lockwood. On the surface, Elvis Presley may have had it all. However, the king of rock and roll's marriage to Priscilla Presley was mostly tumultuous, with drug use, infidelity, and loneliness dominating the couple's time together. This is the true story about Elvis's relationship with Priscilla Presley. Elvis Presley and Priscilla Beaulieu's relationship started in the summer of 1959 in West Germany of all places. Priscilla's father, Paul, was in the Air Force at the time and had just been transferred to West Germany. She was just 14, having recently won the title of Queen of Del Valley Junior High and was nervous about moving to a new place. Luckily, Elvis was also stationed in West Germany, not far from the base that the Beaulieu family would be staying at. Elvis was drafted into the service in 1958, and during his time in Germany, he was part of the 1st Medium Tank Battalion, 32nd Armor. Priscilla was introduced to Elvis by Curry Grant, a member of the Air Force stationed at the same base as her family. She was incredibly nervous about meeting the star for the first time, and thought that because of her young age, she wouldn't make an impression on him. She was dead wrong. Presley immediately took a liking to Priscilla, performing several songs for her on his piano and introducing her to his grandmother, Minnie Mae Presley. She did not return home until 2 in the morning, much to her parents' chagrin, and she was already starting to fall in love. When Elvis called Grant to arrange another meeting a few days later, Priscilla was ecstatic about seeing him again. I mean, he just connected he connected their relationship notoriously turbulent got off to a rocky start from the very beginning according to biographer peter goralnik in careless love the unmaking of elvis presley the rock icon had started dating a 19 year old german woman named elizabeth stefaniak before he met priscilla elvis and stefaniak had started seeing each other around thanksgiving time in 1958 just months after elvis was stationed in germany by valentine's day 1959 stefaniak was living with elvis in his home on the base she claims they refrained from having full intercourse due to elvis's fear of pregnancy but they they slept together every night and fooled around. When Elvis started seeing Priscilla Beaulieu the following summer in 1959, he was still sleeping with Stefaniak every night. She became intensely jealous of the blooming relationship and especially of Priscilla. However, it was becoming clear to Stefaniak that Elvis was much more interested in his new friend than he was in her. He started devoting more and more of his intimate time with Priscilla and left Stefaniak dangling on a string. As one might expect, adapting to the new lifestyle proved to be tough at times for Priscilla Beaulieu. The hustle and bustle of everyday life as an Air Force brat was certainly one thing, but dating one of the most famous musicians and movie stars in the world was quite another. During Christmas of 1962, 17-year-old Priscilla went to see Elvis Presley for a quick visit. Since they had limited time together, they tried to cram in as many activities as possible, and all of the excitement started to wear her out. According to Koralnik's biography, Careless Love, Elvis gave Priscilla two big red pills to relax, and she ended up being knocked out for two days. This was the second time that she had used drugs with Elvis. Earlier in the summer, Priscilla had taken a trip to Las Vegas with Elvis and his entourage. Between limousine rides and playing blackjack, Priscilla found herself overwhelmed by the excitement. According to Priscilla's autobiography, Elvis and Me, she began using amphetamines and sleeping pills in order to keep up. Elvis himself had started abusing prescription medication during his time in the army, and by the time he was dating Priscilla, it had only gotten worse. When Elvis Presley and Priscilla Beaulieu started dating, it was a whirlwind experience for the young woman. She was only 14 at the time and had just started going to high school when the relationship started. Not surprisingly, dating the king of rock and roll sometimes took a toll on her schoolwork. According to Priscilla's autobiography, when she first went back to school after a date with the star, she could not pay attention because her thoughts were entirely on Elvis. Instead of focusing on her schoolwork, she was imagining spending time with the young rock star and trying to relive the memories from the previous night. I occupied a lot of his time. I mean, he, he had a uh, an affinity toward me, you know, he, he had a great care for me. In 1963, after the Beaulieu family moved back stateside, she convinced her parents to let her move to Memphis, Tennessee so that she could be closer to Elvis. However, Priscilla still had to keep going to school, which she tried to do while seeing Elvis nearly every night. During a 2022 interview with the Daily Mail, she described the challenges of trying to balance the two together. The couple would frequently stay out until the early hours of the morning, and she would barely have time for a few hours of sleep before going off to school, Priscilla told the Daily Mail. As a result, I didn't do well with the grades. Still, it was worth it for her if it meant she could spend her free time with Elvis. We did. We had a really close relationship. 
In the summer of 1963, Elvis Presley returned to Hollywood to start shooting the film Viva Las Vegas, which would star Anne Margaret, a 22-year-old actress who was just starting to skyrocket to popularity. The two started to spend a considerable amount of time together, and when the press got wind, they immediately dubbed the two a couple and published an article about their romance. However, Elvis had started seeing Priscilla Beaulieu again earlier in the year on a trip to Las Vegas, and she was living in his parents' home in Memphis, Tennessee. Priscilla was becoming worried about the increasing number of headlines about Elvis and Anne Margaret, and wanted to to visit him on set, but he kept making excuses for why she could not come and see him in person. Finally, she demanded to come and visit the set after months of excuses and suspicions. The visit initially started well, but on the last day of production, the press published a story titled Elvis Wins Love of Anne Margaret, in which Anne Margaret claimed in an interview to be engaged to Elvis. Anne Margaret later said that the press had fabricated the entire interview, but the damage was already done. Elvis managed to calm down Priscilla, who was understandably upset, by promising to never see the young actress again. In reality, he continued to engage in secret communications with Anne Margaret for months. I mean, he spent more time kissing women in the yes. crowd on the lips than oh, he yeah. did singing. I yes. mean, was that difficult to watch? Um, yeah. Elvis Presley and his entourage returned to Graceland in late November to settle down for the 1966 Christmas season. They arrived to a fully made-up nativity scene at the house, and all the residents came out to greet them in a very joyous affair. Elvis ended up donating over $100,000 over the course of a year, highlighted by gifts to all the Memphis charities during the holiday season. His friends noted that he seemed to be in great spirits at the time, and he started spending a lot of time in the barn with the horses on his ranch. Both Priscilla Beaulieu and her father had been sending Elvis signals for months that they were expecting marriage to happen soon. And Elvis himself had been considering the possibility for a while. Finally, just days before Christmas, Elvis finally asked Priscilla to marry him. On May 1, 1967, Priscilla Beaulieu finally became Priscilla Presley. According to close friend Jerry Schilling in his biography, Me and a Guy Named Elvis, My Lifelong Friendship with Elvis Presley, the singer's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, arranged the ceremony and made sure it was a very private affair. Even most of the members of the Memphis Mafia, Elvis's close-knit group of friends and followers, found themselves without invitations. They were married at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, one of the premier hotels on the Strip at the time. The couple entered the hotel through the back entrance to avoid attention and were married in the very early hours of the morning. Two MGM photographers were on hand to document the occasion. After their May wedding in Las Vegas, the happy couple immediately embarked on what would be an extravagant honeymoon. In her autobiography, Elvis and Me, Priscilla Presley recalled how Elvis was able to borrow the personal Learjet to famous musician Frank Sinatra to fly them from Sin City to Palm Springs, California. They were immediately greeted by a throng of reporters, both at the airport and outside the house they were staying at. They had not slept in nearly two days by this point, but they were both elated with the joy of being newlyweds. The honeymoon was special for both of them, and Priscilla Presley, still just 21 at the time, was finally feeling accepted by both her husband and the mainstream press. So if I could say to you, right, you can relive one moment with Elvis again, which one would you choose? Uh, probably our wedding. Nine months to the day that they had their wedding, Elvis and Priscilla Presley welcomed their daughter, Lisa Marie Presley, to the world. She was born on February 1, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, and her parents' home at the Graceland Estate. Lisa Marie lived there until she was four years old, at which point her parents got divorced and separated. However, Elvis and Priscilla Presley had joint custody of her, so she was still able to split her time between the two of them, at least for a few years. Tragically, Lisa Marie Presley was only nine when her father died of apparent heart failure, so she grew up not really knowing him. However, their lives share some similarities. Both Lisa Marie and her dad had issues with addiction dating back to their younger years, with Lisa Marie using drugs by the time she was just 17. On a happier note, she also had a successful music career like her father, though not nearly at the same level. While casual fans of Elvis Presley might not know this, he was actually a dedicated practitioner of karate. After he married Priscilla, Elvis and his wife started doing karate together. At first, Priscilla just did it to spend time with her husband. The more Priscilla got involved in karate, however, the more she fell in love with it. Although karate initially seemed to bring the couple together, by 1972, it was beginning to have the opposite effect. Priscilla started to take private lessons with expert trainer Mike Stone. Eventually, the private lessons turned intimate. Priscilla wrote in her autobiography, My relationship with Mike had now developed into an affair. She was torn by her intense love for her husband and her feelings of neglect and loneliness that had started to develop over the past years. A short time later, Priscilla Presley left her husband for the final time. He was the love of my life, truly. If anything, I left because I needed to find out what the world was like, really. 
Though the couple entered into their marriage in May 1967 with the intention of staying together forever, by 1973 the relationship was in tatters. After her affair with Mike Stone and their subsequent breakup a few months later, Priscilla and Elvis Presley rarely saw each other. According to Elvis and me, they still chatted over the phone, but they knew the relationship was over. He had started dating a new woman, Linda Thompson, by the time the divorce proceedings began at the end of the year. He was incredibly emotional during the divorce hearing, and Priscilla Presley comforted her husband throughout the ordeal. As much as he wanted to be married and have a family, I don't know if he was ever cut to be married. Elvis and Priscilla Presley's marriage had been tumultuous for years, as issues relating to intimacy, infidelity, and loneliness began to overwhelm them. The divorce was made final on October 9, 1973, but it was hardly the end of their relationship. The two agreed to split custody of their daughter, Lisa Marie Presley, and Elvis agreed to give his ex-wife a $100,000 lump sum settlement, along with $1,500 in monthly support. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357. Everybody knows Elvis Presley, but did you know that Elvis had a twin or that his controversial manager may have committed murder? Keep watching for everything else you need to know about the untold truth of Elvis Presley. Though Elvis Presley would go on to become the king of rock and roll and the best-selling recording artist of all time, his upbringing didn't promise all of that success. The Mississippi native was brought up in humble circumstances and endured a difficult and at times traumatic childhood. The first tragedy of Elvis's life occurred at the time of his birth. According to Peter Goralnik, whose biography, Last Train to Memphis, The Rise of Elvis Presley, was published to critical acclaim in 1995, Elvis was raised as an only child, but was in fact a twin. His brother, Jesse Guerin, was stillborn, having been delivered at 4 a.m. on January 8, 1935, around half an hour before Elvis himself. The heartbreaking facts of Jesse's death before Elvis's birth had severe emotional repercussions for the surviving twin. The future superstar would pay repeated visits to his twin brother's unmarked grave throughout his childhood, ruminating on his lost brother at Priceville Cemetery in the Presley's hometown of Tupelo. As he grew older and became famous, Elvis made no secret of his loss, referring to Jesse frequently in interviews, while Elvis's mother Gladys reportedly comforted herself with the belief that Elvis's incredible success had come in part from inheriting the strength of his brother Jesse. For many, the story of Elvis Presley's rise is emblematic of the American dream, but in the early years of his childhood it looked highly unlikely that he would find success, as financial difficulties saw his poor family struggling to survive. Elvis was born in the middle of the Great Depression, and the Presley family felt the full force of the severe economic downturn. While the maternal side of Elvis's family was closely associated with the church, his father Vernon, who described himself as a common laborer, took on a variety of small jobs to make ends meet, meaning that young Elvis had an unsettled life. The most troubling moment of Elvis's early years occurred in 1937, when Vernon was sentenced to three years in jail, along with Gladys' brother Travis and a family friend, for forging and attempting to cash a $4 check. There is no evidence that Vernon and his accomplices were habitual criminals, and one neighbor told Peter Goralnik that they believed that the men had been made an example of. Sadly, the incident simply demonstrates the severe financial difficulties so many American families like the Presleys were experiencing at the time. Though Vernon was released after eight months, the Presleys lost their home while he was away, meaning Gladys and young Elvis had to rely on family and friends for food and shelter. It may sound absurd to suggest that the most successful musician in the history of rock and roll was a musical failure, but this is how his talent was considered in his early years, or at least when it came to the opinion of his teachers and peers. Elvis Presley was an unusual school student, with a persona far removed from that which would emerge as his musical career unfolded. His family had recently relocated from Tupelo to Memphis in yet another upheaval. Elvis was an outsider who made little impression on those around him in his first years at the city's Humes High School. It was through music that Elvis would eventually find his identity identity, playing guitar at break times and during lunch hour for his fellow students, who were said to care little for his music. Even Elvis's 8th grade music teacher, Miss Marmon, allegedly told Elvis that he had no talent as a singer. When I went to Humes High School in Memphis, I was taking music. I flunked music just flat. Whew. F. Only thing I ever failed. In response, the future king brought his guitar to class and performed a version of Fairly Holden's Keep Them Cold Icy Fingers Off of Me leading Marmon to admit she had little aptitude for assessing the merits of rock and roll. After graduating from school at the age of 18 in 1953, Elvis Presley, who had taken on a series of odd jobs throughout his teens, became a truck driver. He seemed, like his father, to be on the path to a life of hard labor. 
However, 1953 was also the year that Elvis' life changed unexpectedly thanks to a single recording made for an audience of one. The official story of Elvis' first record goes that on July 18, 1953, the future superstar walked into the studios of the Memphis Recording Service, operated by Sun Records. He planned to cut an acetate as a gift for his mother Gladys, who had bought him his first guitar way back on his 11th birthday. The recording, with my happiness on one side and that's when your heartaches begin on the other, cost $4. And though his mother reportedly never even heard the recording for herself, as the Presley family didn't own a record player at the time, the session had a profound impact on Elvis' life, as it caught the attention of Sun Records boss Sam Phillips. The producer retained Elvis to record further songs for the label. Elvis' first recording has never been publicly released, but in 2014, the acetate was the star lot at a Graceland auction when it sold for an eye-popping $300,000. In the years following his first recordings for Sun Records, Elvis Presley carved out a musical identity through a string of singles released under the guidance of label boss Sam Phillips. But the song that changed everything for Elvis was Heartbreak Hotel. It was the first single he released after signing to the major Nashville label RCA Victor in 1956. The song would become Elvis' first million seller and make him a household name overnight. The song was introduced to Elvis by co-writer Mae Bourne Axton, whose inspiration for it has long been believed to have been a suicide note published in a local paper reading, I Walk a Lonely Street, which became the song's memorable refrain. Don't mind if they think I've only written the one, because right. it's a classic. However, recent research has uncovered the news story Axton and her co-writer Tommy Durden had almost certainly been inspired by. It was the tale of Alvin Crawley, a young artist who turned to crime in the aftermath of a heartbreaking divorce. Though guilt led Crawley to hand himself into police after a spate of robberies, he eventually returned to crime and was shot to death attempting to hold up a liquor store. The famous line was quoted as deriving from Crawley's unpublished autobiography. Future pop star Elton John recalled Elvis' breakthrough hit, saying of the song, I changed my life. Elvis Presley changed everyone's life. I mean, there would be no Beatles. There would be no Hendrix. There would be no Dylan. It is unlikely that anyone viewing Elvis Presley's iconic January 1957 performance on The Ed Sullivan Show today would guess that it had in any way been censored. In the footage, the by now established musical sensation gave a charismatic performance of some of his biggest hits to that point, culminating in a soulful rendition of the gospel song Peace in the Valley. The session ended with Sullivan making a sincere declaration about Elvis. I wanted to say to Elvis Presley in the country that this is a real, decent, fine boy. Then he wished Elvis' future career in music and movies all the success in the world. However, the story behind Elvis' first big national television appearances is far more checkered than that last appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show might suggest. In fact, the performance was censored in as much as the 21-year-old superstar was only filmed from the waist up. The decision to film Presley in such a way had been prompted by Sullivan's producers' concerns over Elvis' divisiveness among older audiences. Elvis had previously performed on The Steve Allen Show and The Milton Berle Show, and had outraged audiences with his pelvis gyrating and rubber leg dance moves. For his first two appearances on Sullivan, Elvis' performance was toned down, but still managed to attract a total of 70,000 complaints from audience members concerned that his moves could corrupt America's youth. Elvis Presley's early career was given a boost thanks to the involvement of a man named Colonel Tom Parker. Parker was a seemingly all-American talent manager from West Virginia who had made his name resurrecting the careers of various singers from the 1930s and 1940s. His title of Colonel was bestowed on him by Governor Jimmy Davis of Louisiana after Parker helped him campaign for governor. But despite his apparent respectability, Parker, who would later gain a reputation as a vicious businessman and ruthless negotiator, was hiding a secret. According to Alana Nash, author of The Colonel, The Extraordinary Story of Colonel Tom Parker and Elvis Presley, Parker wasn't from the U.S. at all. He was an illegal immigrant who had stowed away to America in his early adulthood and took on Parker as an assumed name. He was born Andreas Cornelis Van Kook and had come to America from his native Holland. It's a well-known fact that Elvis only ever performed to North American audiences, and apart from three shows in Canada, only ever in the United States. The U.S. is, of course, a big music market and easily lucrative enough to sustain the career of an artist of Elvis's caliber. But there is the big question of why he never toured abroad. Allegedly, the reason for this lack of international performances was Colonel Tom Parker. According to the biographer Alana Nash, Parker was afraid that if he traveled abroad with Elvis, his status as an illegal U.S. resident might be revealed. Why Parker would be so cautious about his true identity has puzzled historians. After Parker served in the U.S. Army, he had the opportunity to have his illegal immigrant status quashed and become naturalized. But as Nash notes, some believe that Elvis's manager may have been involved in the murder of a Dutch woman. That crime may have prompted his sudden emigration from Holland. 
It has been postulated that Parker may have feared the Netherlands' extradition deal with the United States and was trying to remain under the radar. If extradited, he would have been brought back to his native country and interviewed over the killing. But while the biographer floated this theory, no investigation has ever brought to light concrete evidence suggesting his involvement in any such crime. By 1957, Elvis was already starring in his third movie, Jailhouse Rock, which some fans believe is the rock and roller's best. Fans have a soft spot for the movie thanks to Elvis, who plays a prison inmate to his behind bars for manslaughter following a bar brawl. In the film, he inhabits a raw and rugged rebellious archetype. Rebellion was an aspect of Elvis's early persona, which was toned down over time due to Colonel Tom Parker's intentional watering down of the Elvis brand. It was done so that he might be palatable to the widest possible audiences. Much of the movie's longevity is owed to its riotous title song, the performance of which is as fun on screen as it is catchy on record. But the concept of a jailhouse rock party wasn't exactly new. Many critics argue that Jailhouse Rock was pretty much a feature-length version of the song Rock Around the Rock Pile. It's a song that describes prisoners jiving to rock and roll, which had appeared in the influential musical The Girl Can't Help It the previous year. Not that anyone who saw Jailhouse Rock seemed to care. But to Elvis's credit, later on, when he encountered rockers such as Gene Vincent, who had been heavily influenced by his style, the king was reportedly gracious and took imitation as flattery rather than theft. In 1958, Elvis was drafted into the U.S. Army and was stationed in Germany for two years. The experience was reportedly transformational and had an enormous impact on Elvis' career and public persona. But Elvis' time in Germany was also significant on a personal level. It was during these years that he would meet the girl who would go on to be his wife. The strange thing is, she was only 14 at the time, while Elvis, one of the most famous people on the planet, was 24. Priscilla was the daughter of an Air Force serviceman who had been transferred to the same German base as Elvis. She spent her time on base playing with her younger brother until a friend of Elvis inquired if she was a fan of his music and whether she would like to meet him. The strangeness of their courtship was also complicated by the fact that Elvis's beloved mother, Gladys, had just recently died, and the musician reportedly saw an uncanny resemblance between his mother and the 14-year-old Priscilla. Elvis walked over to me and he said, oh, what do we have here? As Priscilla revealed in a 1985 People magazine article that after meeting her parents, the two began a long courtship of nightly meetings, private talks, and passionate kissing. She wrote, Something in his southern upbringing had taught him that the right girl was to be saved for marriage. I was that girl. The pair eventually married in 1967 and had a daughter together, Lisa Marie, before divorcing in 1972. As well as his future wife Priscilla, there was another obsession that the king of rock and roll would encounter during his years in the U.S. Army, martial arts. This would become one of the key passions of his life outside of music, especially karate. What do you do for relaxation? You said you studied karate. <laughs> if you can relax doing this, I don't know. Elvis began training with a German karate expert, Jürgen Seidel, at his off-base home in Nauheim in 1958. And his dedication to the arts is shown by the fact that within months of his return to Memphis in 1960, he was bestowed with his first black belt by local trainer Hank Slamansky. He later trained with Master Kong Ree, who would remain his karate teacher into the 1970s. Elvis was so enamored with karate that he even opened a dojo, the Tennessee Karate Institute, in 1974. Though considered by many outside observers something of an eccentricity in the Elvis Presley story, the musician's intense dedication to the arts has been highlighted by martial arts publications such as Black Belt Magazine as unusually pioneering. The magazine noted that rather than him simply being a celebrity practitioner, attaining the level of a black belt in 1960 was notable as he was one of perhaps only a hundred Americans to hold a black belt in karate at the time. By 1974, Elvis was honored with an eighth degree karate black belt, signaling his incredibly high level of skill and dedication. Elvis Presley seemed to have a real affinity with martial arts, and he was reportedly more than happy to use his passion to impress. As noted by Black Belt Magazine, Elvis made use of martial arts in many of his movies, being one of the very first actors to do so before the arrival of Bruce Lee cemented karate as an on-screen staple. Behind closed doors, Elvis also used karate to impress his friends and acquaintances, leading to some extraordinary encounters with his fellow celebrities. While hosting the British pop music panel show Nevermind the Buzzcocks in 2011, veteran shock rocker Alice Cooper recalled meeting Elvis in 1970. According to Cooper, he was invited to meet Elvis at his hotel room in an improbable quartet alongside Liza Minnelli, Linda Lovelace, and Chubby Checker. Cooper was thrilled to meet Elvis, while Elvis reportedly told Cooper that he was a fan of his stage act, which at the time involved a live snake coiled around his neck. Then, things started to get weird. According to Cooper, though they had all been checked for weapons before they entered the hotel room, Elvis proceeded to reach into a draw and pull out what Cooper describes as a loaded snub-nosed 38 pistol. Elvis handed the weapon to Cooper. 
telling him that he would then demonstrate how to disarm someone with a gun. Cooper joked that he began having intrusive thoughts about being the man who shot Elvis Presley, but that before he could act, he was on his back on the floor, with Elvis standing over him, gun in hand. Before I could decide what to do, I was on the floor, and he's had his boot in my throat. I'm going, ha, it's good, Elvis. Graceland, Elvis Presley's sprawling Memphis home, is an integral part of his legend and is today a place of pilgrimage for Elvis devotees. In addition to the opulence of the estate itself, Graceland was notable as the home of the many animals the Presleys kept throughout Elvis's lifetime. The official Graceland website states that the singer bought the property and a surrounding 13.8 acres of surrounding land in 1957, shortly after his big national breakthrough and the success of some of his most prominent music and movies. The Presley menagerie started with typical farm animals. Elvis's mother, Gladys, reportedly kept several chickens on the land. His father, Vernon, kept hogs, and Graceland was also the home of several donkeys. A turkey named Bowtie was reportedly the singer's beloved pet, while the Presleys also bought horses and ponies, one of which was given to Elvis's daughter, Lisa Marie. The king also had several dogs. But soon, the menagerie grew more exotic. In 1961, Elvis bought a chimpanzee, and in 1966 was gifted a spider monkey, both of which lived at Graceland. Other animals, however, were reportedly given to the Memphis Zoo, including two wallabies that had been sent to Elvis by Australian fans on learning that the king was an animal lover. It is commonly held that Elvis Presley was devoted to his music and generally good to his fans, especially in his early years. But in 1974, one cynical release revealed that not all was well with Elvis and his team, and led to the King's name being on the front of what has been called by many critics the very worst album of all time. As biographer Alana Nash explains, in 1974, Elvis's longtime manager, Colonel Tom Parker, was attempting to establish a new company with Elvis's father, Boxcar Enterprises. Through this company, he was attempting to manage Elvis's commercial interests, such as merchandising. The Colonel, however, reportedly skewed the book so that he would receive 10 times the income that Elvis himself received. Parker was also attempting to wrest control of Elvis's recordings from his label, RCA Victor. Seemingly testing the waters in terms of what he could release without stepping on the toes of RCA, Boxcar Enterprises released Having Fun with Elvis on Stage, a bizarre talking-only album made up of recorded bits of speech, audience interaction, and humming, taken from Elvis's live recordings which didn't contain any songs. Writing for all music, critic Mark Deming has called the album sheer perversity and likened the experience of listening to a full-on car crash. Elvis's avowed patriotism saw him attempt to preserve U.S. political heritage. In 1964, the musician bought the USS Potomac, a ship famously used by President Franklin D. Roosevelt as a floating White House between 1936 and 1945. Roosevelt thought so highly of the ship that, as well as using it as a place to relax, he also received foreign guests aboard the Potomac, most notably the British royal family in 1939. When the ship seemed destined for the scrap heap, Elvis, with the support of Colonel Tom Parker, attempted to rescue it through the purchase. From there, they attempted to repurpose it as a national shrine that might raise funds for the March of Dimes Foundation. The foundation is a mother and baby charity set up by Roosevelt himself, but maintenance costs meant that the foundation rejected the plan. Following Elvis's ownership, the Potomac was seized by authorities who in 1980 believed that it was involved in drug smuggling. The ship then sank while impounded at San Francisco's Treasure Island, but was eventually raised for restoration, and is now operated and preserved by a team of volunteers. There are many myths and legends concerning Elvis Presley's only encounter with the Beatles, whom he met on August 27, 1965, including many accounts that an incredible jam session took place between the two acts. However, as noted by the BBC, while the Fab Four were keen to have a meeting with the King, all involved wanted to avoid the event turning into a publicity stunt. This meant that no press were invited and that no photographs or recordings of the event were ever made for posterity. However, Elvis's attitude toward his British counterparts would eventually be revealed years later, with the unsealing of the King's FBI files. In 1970, Elvis delivered a handwritten letter to the White House, requesting an audience with President Richard Nixon. At the meeting, Elvis suggested that he could be a useful ally in the ongoing war on drugs. Most strangely of all, the rock and roll star identified a number of his fellow entertainers as potential security risks, among them the Beatles. For that band in particular, he suggested that they ought to be banned from entering the United States at all. Elvis had grown increasingly concerned about their transformation into hippies in the years since their meeting, and saw their use of an image of Karl Marx on the cover of their album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band as evidence that they were anti-American. Throughout his life, Elvis Presley maintained a rapport with numerous police officers and even entire forces, often donating funds to support policing causes. Graceland reports Memphis patrolman Jim Hammers as stating, I don't care where he was, whenever he saw the police, Elvis always stopped and talked to them. 
He would drive up beside them in the streets and get them to pull over. He would spend hours at a time talking with them in different places. In one bizarre incident, Elvis also got involved in police work, when after witnessing a traffic collision, he aided officers by directing traffic around the scene of the accident. Seeing Elvis in the middle of an intersection telling motorists where to go was surely a surreal sight for passing drivers. Elvis was also famously a collector of police badges, having first been gifted one by a girl at a skating rink in Memphis in 1957. Elvis collected police badges from wherever he traveled in the United States, and even managed to secure for his collection a badge from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs during his meeting with President Nixon. However, Priscilla Presley would suggest a more underhanded motive, writing in her 1985 memoir, Elvis and Me. The NARC badge represented some kind of ultimate power to him. In Elvis's mind, that badge would give him the right to carry any prescribed drug he had on this person. Priscilla claimed that Elvis believed having the badge would allow him to take drugs overseas, and that his entourage would be able to carry any guns they pleased on their travels. For a long time, the thought that Elvis Presley might still be alive was perhaps the most famous conspiracy theory besides the supposed faking of the Apollo 11 moon landing. When news broke that the king of rock and roll had died on August 16, 1977 at the age of 42 following a heart attack, the news was so shocking that many of his fans seemingly couldn't believe it. In an effort to deny the loss of their hero, fans started casting around for clues that might challenge the official account. On the 40th anniversary of his death, Time published an article exploring the most notable conspiracy theories surrounding Elvis' demise. The article included conspiracies such as that he faked his death to escape the Mafia, or that he had entered the Witness Protection Program after aiding the FBI. In the years since his death, belief in such theories has declined. A poll in the mid-1990s suggested that around 11% of Americans were still open to the idea that Elvis is still alive, but this had dropped sharply to 4% by 2000. But whatever we may think of these numbers, Elvis devotees still have reason to rejoice as his fan base is continuing to grow. For CBS News, a 2017 poll revealed that 47% of Americans still count themselves as Elvis fans, the highest figure in more than a quarter of a century. It seems Elvis won't be leaving the building for some time yet. A father-like figure who meddled in Elvis' marriage, racked in 50% of Elvis' earnings and became the suspect in a murder case? Who was Elvis' manager, and why didn't he care when his star client died? Find out right here. Before getting into the relationship between the king and his manager, a quick crash course in the pre-Elvis life of Colonel Tom Parker is in order. Parker liked to present himself as an American man called Thomas Andrew Parker, but he wasn't a born and bred West Virginian any more than he was a military colonel. His true identity was Andreas Cornelius Van Kook, an illegal immigrant who was originally from the Netherlands, and he may or may not have decided to leave his family behind and try his luck stateside after becoming a person of interest in a murder case in his original hometown of Breda. That's a whopper of a backstory, and things only got stranger when he started his new life across the pond. While he did serve in the U.S. military in the early 1930s, Parker never achieved any lofty ranks beyond a private. Interestingly, this period in his life came to an abrupt end after he was imprisoned for desertion, diagnosed as a psychopath, and kicked out. However, he eventually received the honorary title of colonel from the governor of Louisiana in 1948. Parker had a circus background from his years in the Netherlands, and after his unsuccessful time in the military, he resumed this career path. In the late 1940s, he started gravitating toward the music industry. Elvis Presley and Colonel Tom Parker first met on February 6, 1955, but the story of their eventual business team started well before that. In 1954, a man named Oscar Davis saw Presley live and met the singer and his manager Bob Neal. At the time, Parker was already an established presence in the entertainment industry, having promoted a vast wealth of country music stars and even early Western actor Tom Mix. Davis believed that young Presley would be a perfect protege for the Colonel, and his recommendation made Parker intrigued enough to attend a show in January 1955. This convinced him to set up a February 6th meeting with Presley's people. Parker signed up with Presley in August, initially acting in an advisory position while Neil remained Presley's official manager. However, it was the Colonel who negotiated Presley's move from Sam Phillips' comparatively small Sun Records to the much larger RCA Records in November 1955. This was no mean feat, because Phillips demanded a then-unprecedented total of $40,000, the equivalent of roughly $436,000 in today's money, for the deal to go through. You have to keep in mind, I was working with untried, unproven people, which was what I wanted to do. Soon after the RCA move, Parker took over as Presley's one and only manager in 1956 and retained control of the singer's affairs until well after Presley's death. 
Colonel Tom Parker wasn't afraid to meddle in his clients' personal affairs. For instance, Parker was shocked when Elvis Presley became interested in 14-year-old Priscilla Beaulieu in 1959, fearing that the king would ruin his career like Jerry Lee Lewis when the latter married his 13-year-old second cousin in 1958. As a result, Beaulieu's existence was kept under wraps, and Presley maintained his image as a desirable bachelor, all the way down to publicly dating numerous women. However, the winds changed as the years flew by, and in 1967, it was time for Presley and Beaulieu to get married. According to Alana Nash's book, The Colonel, the extraordinary story of Colonel Tom Parker and Elvis Presley, Parker had likely been toying with the idea for quite some time. A 1961 press release discussed the prospect of the star's eventual marriage at some length, and even painted the colonel as a fatherly figure who might very well bestow his advice on the matter. The book posits that Parker's motivation to get Presley hitched was to stop his wild behavior and avoid violating the morals clause in his contracts. The fact that Elvis was reportedly interested in acquiring the services of girlfriend and Margaret's manager may also have factored into the situation. As for Presley, he may have been less than keen about the situation. Reportedly, his housekeeper found him weeping before the wedding and admitting that he was being forced to go through with it. Though Elvis Presley is certainly a rock and roll legend, his movie career failed to light the world on fire. I owe you seven weeks sorry, plus... <laughs> a quick glance at the King's IMDb page reveals that while his cinematic endeavors are actually quite numerous, it wouldn't be unfair to say that his 31 acting credits are mostly notable for the fact that, well, it was him in the movie. Colonel Tom Parker was in charge of Presley's acting roles as much as he was in charge of every other contract in the artist's career. The Washington Post has actually called this unimpressive cinematic streak Parker's biggest failing, not only because of the movies Parker signed Presley up for, but because of the opportunities he reportedly shot down. These include the role of Joe Buck in John Schlesinger's 1969 drama Midnight Cowboy, and the male lead in the 1976 version of A Star is Born. These roles eventually went to John Voight and Chris Christopherson, while Presley's film resume consists of works like Blue Hawaii, Tickle Me, and Clambake. Could Presley have outacted guys like Voigt and Christofferson should the roles have gone his way? That might be up for debate, but if Parker didn't even give him the opportunity to try, it doesn't seem very managerial of him, does it? Colonel Parker was an illegal immigrant who had changed his name and may not have held a U.S. passport at all. This, some suspect, may have been behind his otherwise mysterious decision to systematically reject all the numerous concert and tour offers Elvis received all over the world. In a 2017 interview with Noise 11, Jerry Schilling, who worked with both Parker and Presley back in the day, stated in no uncertain terms that Presley himself was more than game to perform abroad, describing a particular conflict about the prospect of an international tour. According to Schilling, Parker immediately stated that he wouldn't follow Presley on any tours, and the situation escalated to the point that the star told the colonel he was fired, only to soon find out that even Elvis Presley didn't hold a torch to Colonel Parker in the entertainment industry. Schilling told the outlet, when Elvis tried to get a tour going, no one would touch him because they were afraid of the colonel. They had the relationship with the colonel. They respected the colonel. They did not want to go behind his back. In the end, the colonel won this particular power struggle. During his entertainment career, Presley's only performances outside the U.S. were three Canadian dates in 1957, and Parker didn't travel with him. Colonel Parker was hardly the model of military discipline his apparent rank might imply. His sole stint in the Army, as a private, ended when he was discharged after going AWOL and being imprisoned. He later managed to dodge the World War II draft with an eating regimen that ballooned his weight north of 300 pounds. Elvis Presley, for his part, couldn't avoid being drafted, and didn't try to do so either. When the Memphis Draft Board came calling in December 1957, the King was already an ultra-famous singer and actor, but he was still all too happy to do his part, as long as they granted him a few months deferral in order to wrap up his latest film. The beginnings of Presley's military service went comparatively well, but things soon took a turn for the worse. In August, his beloved mother died, and the shaken Presley was soon moved to Germany. There, he partied hard and developed a drug addiction that lasted for the rest of his life. It could be said that joining the military ruined his life. Elvis Presley was only 42 years old when he died on August 16, 1977. Presley's father let Colonel Tom Parker have the run of things for two more years, but after the elder Presley also died in 1979, things got complicated for the manager. The new legal protector of Elvis's 12-year-old daughter, Lisa Marie, looked into the estate's financial situation and compiled a report that confirmed the long-standing rumors that Parker took a whopping 50% of Presley's income, as opposed to the normal much lower percentage. This was just the tip of the iceberg, too. 
The reports also found that the manager's actions had directly cost Presley a nine-figure sum over the years and exposed several areas of poor and neglectful management that had hurt the artist financially. The report read, Elvis was naive, shy, and unassertive. Parker was aggressive, shrewd, and tough. His strong personality dominated Elvis, his father, and all others in Elvis' entourage. In 1982, the estate took Parker to court for his actions in a case that ended in a settlement and effectively removed the colonel from the Elvis business. As for the Presley estate, it managed to rise from the ashes to the point that its 2020 net worth was an estimated $400 to $500 million, according to Rolling Stone. Because Colonel Tom Parker has something of a controversial reputation, it's easy to believe that the late manager's acquaintances would be quick to air their grievances about him whenever possible. In an interview with The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Tom Hanks noted that he expected this when he met Elvis' ex-wife Priscilla Presley. Hanks was looking for her insight for his role as Parker in the movie Elvis. But while Presley did mention that the colonel had some negative traits, she actually had kind words about him. Hanks described Priscilla's words during the meeting, telling Colbert, and she said, no, he was a wonderful man, I, and I wish he was alive today. He took really great care of us. He was a scoundrel in his way. This may be surprising to hear from Priscilla, considering that she was there when the estate's investigations revealed a court battle-worthy amount of financial shady stuff about the colonel. Yet, even after the case was settled, she didn't seem to hold too much ill will. Priscilla told the Los Angeles Times in 1989, I saw how Elvis lived and saw his relationship with Colonel Parker, so I think I have a much better understanding of it than the outsider who comes in and says, oh my god, this was robbery. It's only natural that the relationship between a manager and an artist is a professional one. However, because Elvis Presley and Colonel Tom Parker worked together for such a long time, it's tempting to assume that the pair developed at least some amount of camaraderie and friendliness over the years. After all, they were both instrumental in steering the good ship Elvis. Yet, as Richard Harrington of the Washington Post has noted, there's no real indication that Parker much cared for his protege, at least beyond the money he brought in. Parker liked to call Presley his attraction, harkening back to the Colonel's days with the circus. Colonel Tom Parker was a carny. Reportedly, his first words after learning about Presley's death were even more telling. According to the Washington Post article, the Colonel said, This won't change anything. Harrington also writes that while Parker was certainly a good promoter, his narrow, finance-focused vision meant that the manager didn't really understand, let alone care about, the cultural impact of Elvis. That said, Parker ended up steering the star toward projects that removed him from his original allure of dangerous rock and roll. Kids have always had their crazes, and fans of Elvis Presley were one of the first iterations of youth fandom culture as we recognize it today. We all know who the King of Rock is, but here's what it was really like to be an Elvis fan in the 1950s. While Elvis Presley is widely considered an icon of the 1950s, the King didn't actually hit national stardom until the second half of the decade, after some prominent appearances on television in 1956. According to the Pop History Dig, before those appearances, Elvis was much more of a regional phenomenon, constantly on the road to promote his music. The musician had a grueling tour schedule in the early 1950s, performing in a new southern town almost every night for months on end. Those early fans who were paying attention to the rising Memphis musician may have been lucky enough to see him at their very own school auditoriums or county fairs. A list of his 1955 performances included humble venues such as Southside Elementary School, Bastrop, Louisiana, or Texas High School, Seymour, Texas. Despite the smaller venues and the fact that he was often the support act to larger artists, it was Elvis's energetic performances that left audiences in a frenzy. Artist Belle Clausen, a fan who saw Elvis perform four times, recalls his first Jacksonville performance where he was opening for Hank Snow's Country in Western Jamboree. He wasn't top dog, but when he sang, the girls went nuts. Nowadays, having a legion of screaming fans is expected of any famous pop star. But before Elvis hopped on the scene, things were apparently different. Before The King made his debut, the last icons that captured the hearts of American women were crooners like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby. But while these balladeers' intimate performances might have had girls swooning, audience reactions still mostly included respectful cheering and applause. It wasn't until Elvis, with his gyrating and husky voice, that the phenomenon of hysterically screaming fans began to be observed. As described by Alan Hansen, author of several Elvis books, the first time Elvis drew that kind of reaction from the crowd, he was shocked, saying, I was scared stiff. Everyone was hollering, and I didn't know what they were hollering at. 
To be fair, some in the audience might not have known either. In a collection of quotes from fans who had attended a 1956 show, a few mentioned that they started screaming just because everyone else was. I honestly did not know why people were so excited, but I knew I'd better act like I was too. So I did my best to imitate the screams with hands to my heart and hair and arms waving the air. In fact, deafening screams that never stopped for the entire duration of the concert was a key point mentioned throughout everyone's recollection. The love and fervor that Elvis ignited in his fans sometimes led him to be physically mobbed. Once during a performance in Jacksonville, Elvis invited the crowd backstage after the show. Whether he was joking or not was of no concern to the hundreds of overenthusiastic fans, who subsequently charged forward past security, mobbed their idol in his dressing room, and literally tore his clothes off his body, according to the book Elvis and Gladys. Such reactions were witnessed in horror several times by Elvis's mother, Gladys, whose own protective instincts jumped in one time when her son performed at a high school in Mississippi. At that show, Gladys apparently clawed through and confronted the mob of fans, furiously asking them, quote, "'Why are you trying to kill my boy?' Amazingly, Elvis was rather unbothered by the chaos that tended to ensue around him. In a 1956 interview, he talked about that Presley riot in Jacksonville. Shucks, they were only tearing my clothes. I didn't mind a bit. One of the most important, life-changing years of Elvis Presley's life was in the mid-50s, 1956 to be exact. That was the year that Elvis went from being a rising rock and roll musician to the biggest star in the United States. And it was all put in motion by the magic of television. By the mid-50s, television had infiltrated almost every family home in America, turning it into a potent tool of mass culture. With only one set in a house and a handful of channels, viewership was highly concentrated, with singular TV programs having the attention of a majority of the population in the country. One legendary program that was wildly popular was The Ed Sullivan Show. Initially, Ed Sullivan had no plans to have Elvis on his show. His was a family show, after all. And there seemed to be nothing family-friendly about Elvis and his gyrating hips. But after the singer brought in huge ratings for competitor programs like The Steve Allen Show earlier that year, Sullivan finally let up on the Presley Band and invited him for three appearances in late 1956. His first appearance was seen by 60 million people, or 82.6% of TV viewers, and shot him straight to the top. As Andrew Solt declares, Elvis on Ed Sullivan was the original Big Bang of rock and roll. Overnight, popular culture was upended. According to Andrew Solt in an interview for the official Graceland website, a post-World War II 1950s America had a sleepy character. Without war looming over everyone's head, much of society had settled down calmly. But for some, calm also means boring. This seemed to be especially true for middle-class teenagers, who had been too young during the war to appreciate the serenity of their lives in the 1950s. When Elvis burst onto the scene, American teens were the first to latch on to who they saw as a breath of fresh Chair, a symbol of the non-traditional. As suggested by Solt, the rock and roll star represented their sense of brewing rebellion. You're tearing me apart! What? You, you say one thing, he says another, and everybody changes back again! As described by Time, there was so much about Elvis that was at odds with the norms of middle-class white America. For one, he sang traditional African-American rhythm and blues music, not only embracing the style but praising and crediting black artists during a time when Jim Crow was the law of the land. He also moved on stage in a sexually suggestive manner that was in direct violation of the purity values imposed by the influential churches of the era. On top of all that, he was a poor Southern boy who at times was unrefined in his speech and mannerisms. All in all, Elvis was everything parents, preachers, and authority figures would have hated. But in a classic youth rebellion, that just made him all the more popular. As it is with many artists, Huge fame often comes with equally strong criticism. Fans of Elvis in the 1950s likely had to deal with those around them, especially older adults, vehemently disapproving of the controversial rock and roll star. While his fans would scream and faint at the sight of his shaking hips, others were horrified at the vulgarity. According to Rolling Stone, churches and religious organizations condemned his moves as lewd and protested the corruption of the youth. Parents saw him and rock and roll as instigators of disobedience and juvenile delinquency. Man, show me that crazy little walk you just did there. Slow it down some. 
These strong opinions sometimes came with extreme actions. Fans in Nashville and St. Louis were probably horrified when crowds in their towns burned and hanged Elvis in effigy after his second appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Whether they knew it or not, Elvis fans were part of a cultural shift in race relations. This stemmed from the fact that Elvis was a white man who popularized what was traditionally a black genre of music. In some ways, his effect on segregated America could be seen as positive. Elvis often made it clear to his audience that black musicians should be credited for the music he performed. According to Newsweek, he once clarified, A lot of people seem to think I started this business, but rock and roll was here a long time before I came along. Nobody can sing that kind of music like black people. Let's face it, I can't sing like Fats Domino can. As a white man, Elvis made rock and roll palatable to a wider audience, which opened new opportunities for the pioneering black artists that were barred from the mainstream. Additionally, Rolling Stone describes how before Elvis, Chuck, and Little Richard, segregated shows were strictly enforced. But as rock and roll started dominating, audiences of both races began to dance together. Of course, whether a love of black music can be tied to genuine respect for the black community has always been dubious. In fact, Elvis's legacy is often criticized as a result of audiences' persistent preference for whiteness. As the griot touches on, while Elvis himself may have honored the black artists who came before him, it's unclear whether his fans paid the same respects. With seven number one hits and an additional 18 top 10 hits on the Billboard Hot 100, it's fair to say that Elvis sold quite a few records in his time. According to the book, The 50s, what made Elvis slightly different than the hit makers that came before him was who was buying his music. For Elvis, the big demographic that loved him were middle-class teenagers, but that would have meant nothing if those teens didn't have the disposable income to mass buy records and sell out shows. Elvis fans in the 50s, as part of a new post-World War II society that was experiencing rare broad-based middle-class prosperity, were part of a new generation where teenagers had significant disposable income, whereas in earlier years, any money they made would go to helping the family. These kids now had the cash to spend on their own interests. And for many, those interests included music. Record players and radios were now more affordable than before, and shopkeepers even started introducing credit buying to the new youth consumer. For teenage Elvis fans, marketing campaigns for records and Elvis merchandise were designed just for them. Through his later appearances and the prominent impersonators that linger around Las Vegas, Elvis may be best known today for his outlandish and iconic jumpsuits. In the 1950s, though, at the start of his ascent, his style was much more understated, yet no less impactful on the impressionable legion of fans that he had. In a collection of quotes from fans who remembered seeing him in 1956, Joe W. Crow, who was 17 years old at the time, recalls, Everyone wanted to be like him, imitate him, sing his songs, try to do hair like his, and dress like him, even doing his famous moves. While his style in the 50s may not be as memorable as his later bedazzled jumpsuits, Elvis still managed to start quite a few trends that decade. According to Hal Lansky, whose father Bernard was one of Elvis's chief stylists, Elvis started wearing pink at a time when it was considered a shade real men never touched. Eventually, the color became huge in the 1950s, including on clothing, Cadillacs, and lawn flamingos. Additionally, the rockabilly look he often sported soon became a defining image of the decade. Since his debut in the 50s, Elvis Presley fans would band together to form official fan clubs. According to the official Graceland website, these fan groups would actually be encouraged and officially recognized by Elvis's management team. Colonel Parker, the prominent businessman behind the star's rise, and his office would actually engage a grassroots promotional strategy by working in tandem with these local fan clubs to promote upcoming album releases and performances in their area. While some informal clubs may have involved a couple of friends coming together in the name for their love of the king, official fan clubs were run like legitimate organizations with founders, leaders, and registered members. Clubs were formed all over the world, even in countries that Elvis had never even performed in. One such club was the official Elvis Presley Fan Club of Great Britain and the Commonwealth. As described by Harry Kerrigan, the OEPFC grew so big with over 7,000 members that the founders actually quit their jobs and ran it as a business in late 1958. As a member, you'd get official membership cards, badges, newsletters, photos, special items, and more. According to the book, 
Elvis Presley, A Southern Life. Elvis Presley had a history of taking advantage of his fans' adoration for him, particularly in the form of preying on underage girls. Such instances include having a group of 14-year-olds with him on tour that would, quote, pillow fight, tickle, wrestle, and kiss Elvis, who was 22 at the time. Many of his girlfriends were underage, such as 15-year-old Dixie Locke, who Elvis dated when he was 19. He also would subsequently cheat on her with fans while he was on tour. These reports show a pattern, especially when one considers Elvis's relationship with his only wife, Priscilla. Elvis, who was 24 years old at the time, met and began a relationship with 14-year-old Priscilla in 1959. Being a fan of Elvis in the 1950s would have put you among some notable company. Countless musical legends have mentioned being a fan of Elvis, often citing him as one of the main reasons they got into music. Cher, at the age of 11 years old, went to an Elvis show as her very first concert. Another recognizable name, Bruce Springsteen, who was six years old when he saw Elvis first perform in 1956 on The Ed Sullivan Show. In 1978, Springsteen declared, Everything starts and ends with Elvis. And of course, his impact wasn't limited to the States. Across the pond in Liverpool, England, members of the Beatles were inspired by Elvis, with the star's influence clearly visible in their early styles and on-stage mannerisms. John Lennon is quoted as once declaring, "'Nothing affected me until I heard Elvis. Without Elvis, there would be no Beatles.'" 